with us. We have a big morning in Studio 1A, so we're going to break down what we're bringing you. All right, we're going to start with the bombshell in the NFL Raiders. Coach John Gruden resigning. He's out after a slew of offensive emails surfaced. We're going to have a full report from the West Coast. We also touch on a bright spot in the NFL. Wait until you see how many members of the Kansas City Chiefs are making their city proud by working to make sure every child has enough to eat. You'll want to stick around for their inspiring stories. And then Chelsea Handler took a break from her latest comedy tour to stop by the studio to hang out with Jenna and Hoda. Whoa. Let's just say the laughs never stopped. You know Chelsea thinks that Jenna and Barbara are her sisters. I know. So she thinks they're triplets. Other, sissies. Sissies. It was a little annoying. It's weird. It, it was a good conversation. Yeah. All those stories plus, well, that's just the starters. Let's go. Let's go. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. NBC Steve Patterson joins us now with details. Hey, Steve, good morning. Savannah Hoda, good morning. Before he stepped down, John Gruden was one of the most high-profile, highest-paid coaches in the NFL. His controversial remarks contained in leak emails dug, dug up over the course of nearly a decade. The league was quick to condemn his behavior, all as it struggles with its own image. And here we go. Overnight, a stunning fall from grace broadcast to millions of primetime football fans. Breaking news tonight, John Gruden out as Las Vegas Raiders head coach. NFL coach and former Monday Night Football analyst John Gruden announcing his exit as head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders after emails uncovered as part of a separate investigation revealed a torrent of sexist, racist, anti-gay language aimed at a slew of targets ranging from players to league officials. In a statement to the team, Gruden saying in part, I love the Raiders and do not wish to be a distraction. I'm sorry, I never meant to hurt anyone. The emails, confirmed by the NFL but not seen by NBC News, were initially discovered during an NFL workplace misconduct investigation into the Washington football team while Gruden was an analyst for ESPN. Last week, it was learned Gruden used a racist trope to describe NFL Union Chief DeMaurice Smith in a 2011 email, writing Dumborius Smith has lips the size of Michelin tires. Then the floodgates opened last night with a New York Times report detailing even more troubling emails showing Gruden using offensive language to insult NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell, also calling the league's first openly gay player Michael Sam a queer, disparaging players who protested during the national anthem, panning the hiring of female referees and mocking league efforts to reduce concussions. It wasn't just something that crossed his mind, which is bad, but that he then took that thought, formalized it in a writing and hit send. People say all sorts of things sort of on the cuff that they shouldn't. This is more than that. According to The Times, Gruden also exchanged emailed photos with other men showing women wearing only bikini bottoms, including NFL cheerleaders. In his statement, the league slammed Gruden's actions, calling them appalling, abhorrent, and wholly contrary to the NFL's values. And Steve, this all comes at a tumultuous time for the NFL. A lot of other challenges. So what does this mean for the league going forward? You know, Hoda, the league is in the middle of an attempted renaissance, trying to reform its image by allowing players to voice their concerns about social justice, even allowing them to wear messages on their helmets. This will be seen as yet another turning point with questions about a toxic culture, likely only leading to the beginning of a deeper look at behavior inside the NFL on top of, of course, what happens to Gruden's 10-year, $100 million contract. We are back with Once in a Lifetime, our series with NBC Sports leading up to the Super Bowl and the Winter Olympics, both of them, of course, here on NBC. Mm -hmm. This morning, the remarkable success of the Kansas City Chiefs off the field that's winning them a lot more fans. Stephanie's here with that story. Good morning, Hi. Yeah. Good morning, guys. You know, the Kansas City Chiefs already have an outsized presence in their city, especially in recent years with a dazzling quarterback and a Super Bowl win to show for it. But the team has long wanted to be more than just some excitement on Sundays. I had a chance to see just what they mean. On the field, these are the guys you don't want to run into. I move people for fun. But when they're not sacking quarterbacks, <laughs> defensive lineman Colin Saunders and Derek Nottie help the Kansas City Chiefs tackle a much tougher opponent, hunger. For young players that are joining the Chiefs, they're probably just thinking, oh God, I got to get on the field and I got to play. Right. How does this then become part of what they do? The message is given to them early on that this is part of being part of this organization. If you're going to be on this team, you're going to be in the community. I feel like the standard is kind of set by 
um, you know, our captains, our leaders, and then we kind of all just fall into that. In Kansas City during the pandemic, requests for food assistance went up as much as 40%. Across the U.S., as many as one in six children will face hunger this year. For over 30 million kids, school lunches are the only reliable meal in their day. That leaves a dangerous gap over the weekends. This one gets a little tricky. The Chiefs work with Harvesters, a local food bank, to put together backpacks of food for kids and their families as part of the Back Snacks program. <laughs> The team also sponsors food drives, helping to generate nearly 1.7 million meals for the city. You guys are kind of like the the ambassadors, right? Yeah, I've always been helping out with, with harvesters. So. I'll just give away my own food just to help out just yeah. any little bit. I'm not from here, but uh, since I'm here, this is part of my community. Yeah. So I want to do my part and do what's the best that I can to help out. At Guadalupe Elementary School, 50 kids go home with a bag of non-perishable food every Friday, usually assembled by Chiefs volunteers from across the organization. And last week, star players pitched in to deliver the backpacks. For these families, it can make all the difference. It's really important, you know, uh, you can never have enough food, to be honest. You could have all the food in the world and still never be enough. In Kansas City, Everyone is a Chiefs fan. Meeting them is even better than game day. What does it show you about them and the team when they take some time and come out to your boys' school? Oh, okay. This is surprising to me. I'm kind of like excited myself because I never saw a Chiefs player. I never been to a game, but I always watched it from home. They were so selfless to come out here and just bring happiness to the children and to all of us because we love the Chiefs out here in Kansas City. <laughs> there is no doubt the Chiefs love their city back. I'm being football players and doing what we do, um, a lot of people around here uh, look up to us and uh, you get to see that joy in their eyes and stuff and, and then also to be able to help and with tying in that joy, it's, just, it's, a, it's a really good thing. And for me, my home is, of course, back in Virginia, but at the same time as I'm here, this is my home. So I want to make sure that I can do anything I can. Lots of teams and individual players give back to their communities across the country. What's interesting about the Chiefs is they are laser focused as a team on the problem of hunger in Kansas mm. City. And they say that that is a way that they feel they can make a real practical difference. There's so many great things that players and teams and organizations do for their community. But there's yep. something particular about the idea of children not mm -hmm. having enough food yeah. Yeah. Right. that just seems yeah. like in the United States of America. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it's a problem. So. And especially bad now uh, during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Right? It's a great story. Beautiful stuff. story, Steph. Thanks. Thank you. Stick around because there is much more coming up on Today in 30. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it? to make this trip. Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. We are back with our series Today Climate. At just 18 years old, Greta Thunberg is arguably the face of the climate movement. I got a chance to speak with her about the action she wants to see now and her hope for our planet's future. People united will never be defeated. Hope is this. Hope is us, the people. Hope is when people gather to make change. Climate activist Greta Thunberg is back. 
After holding rallies virtually for more than a year, she's taking to the streets once again, challenging world leaders. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. Green economy, blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, blah, blah. Net zero, blah, blah, blah. Climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. Thunberg's Fridays for Future marches resumed last month and are gaining momentum ahead of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP26, later this month. If you could fill in the blah, 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 uh, what words would you want to hear from these leaders? Uh, I mainly wouldn't want to hear words because we've heard many words, but as it is now, these words aren't really leading to anything. In 2019, Thunberg grabbed the world's attention by sailing to New York City on an emissions-free, solar-powered racing yacht to attend the United Nations General Assembly, giving what became one of the most memorable speeches in UN history. How dare you! You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil, and that I refuse to believe. The then 16-year-old was angry that promises made in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement were not being met, namely by the U.S. and China, who are responsible for 80% of global emissions. What would you say is the price of waiting as opposed to globally trying to take action, no matter how small or large? I think that already we are seeing devastating effects of inaction and of waiting. And if we continue to wait, that will only get worse. These damages will be irreversible. The UN says global warming has already pushed our planet into a code red for humanity. And Greta is challenging more than 100 countries to renew their vow to reduce carbon emissions by 2030 and actually fulfill those promises. What do you think it is going to take for that change to happen? It's, it's a very big task that's ahead of us. We need to, to change social norms. One thing that it will take is honesty. We need to be honest about what we are doing and we need to be brave because if we do not start to treat the crisis like a crisis, then the people around us will not understand that we are in an emergency. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it? to make this trip. Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Well, our good friend Dylan Dreyer has been waiting a long time for this arrival. Yep. 
We're not talking about baby Rusty. No, no, not Russell. Dylan's first children's book, Misty the Cloud, A Very Stormy Day, is officially out, and we are Yay. thrilled. Yay. Thrilled hey and now. Uh, to chat about it this morning. And and here's the thing, like giving birth to Rusty and giving birth to a children's book, I would imagine they're, they're right on the same level. <laughs> Well, the excitement was high for both of them. Um, you know, I really could have placed many bets that the book was going to come out first. I didn't think uh, uh, Rusty would come out first, but <laughs> oh well. What oh can well. You do? Can't plan that. Can I just tell you, I'm, I'm being so obviously, I'm being genuine. You look so good, Dylan. Like, yes. you, you are seriously glowing. Thank you. Chanel, Chanel, you'll relate to this. You know when you don't wear makeup for like a couple weeks and then yeah. you put makeup on for the first time? You just, that is you know, true. it feels and like your it face goes on, got right? Break. It's like it's perfect. I think that's what happens. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about your other baby, this awesome book. Tell everybody at home if they haven't heard what Missy the Cloud is all about. Uh, I wish I had a copy, but Oliver just just took it out of my hand. So <laughs> I, I can't get it we back have to it. Don't um, yeah. worry, Dylan. <laughs> Of course, the one on so, screen is much thicker than ours. I know, ours. it does. It looks like a textbook. <laughs> it's not that long. It's only like 30. Oh, thank oh, you. It's wow. only like 32 pages. What a good thank boy. You, I knew you needed okay. it. So, um, so, yeah, so Misty, the, she's a cloud. Um, and I just always imagined what a world would look like up in the clouds. And the, the thing that's cool about this is I, I find that weather and... Um, sorry, I can't even focus now. Weather and emotions kind of parallel each other. You know, it's like... Nice weather makes you feel good. Cloudy weather makes you feel a little different. Stormy weather, you can kind of feel like what it's like to have a, an angry mood day. And that's that's sort of what this book is. So you've got this whole world up in the clouds, and Misty's just having a bad day. It's, it's okay to have a bad day. And I think that's the message in this book is it's okay to feel, you know, not always the best feelings. You can kind of just things can go wrong and just make you feel grumpy. But when Misty feels grumpy, she's a cloud, she kind of turns into a thunderstorm. And it parallels this girl. Claire's world on the ground and you know Misty's actions impact Claire's day it rains out her softball game and um, you know so it's it's all about it's okay to feel emotions but what do you do with them so mm -hmm. Misty tries to find joy in things around her find you know they're, they're there's just like nice things that happen that makes you kind of forget that you were grumpy to begin with. So it's it's all about how to handle some of those moods that you might have. Hey, Dylan, I was telling my I gave my kids the book last night and, and I was telling them that it doesn't just include the story, but it's got, you know, information and activities um, regarding weather. And, and I think I mean, are you going to do one of them with us now with paper bags? Is that right? <laughs> That's the plan. So, you know, I didn't want to beat people over the heads. With we got the paper bags here. I wanted it to be just a nice book. Um, but in the back of the book, it, it explains the science. What causes a thunderstorm? What's an updraft? What's a downdraft? Uh -huh. And then there's also some activities you can do. Um, you know, a lot of kids can be scared of thunder. It's, it's loud, it's but I, I tried to explain what thunder is. So um, if you think about it, lightning, it's very, very hot. It's hotter than the sun. Mm -hmm. And when it, it strikes, it heats up the air around it and forces it in all different directions very, very quickly. So can we make thunder at home? Well, if you have a paper lunch bag, uh -huh. you fill it up with air, right? All right. You haven't done this in a while. I haven't had a paper lunch bag in a This while. is what I do when I'm anxious. <laughs> so you fill it up, and then you pop it. Woo! Here we go. Oh! Wow. wow. <laughs> I was, I was taking a while, I guess, to blow mine up. Wait, that's pretty wow. cool. You might, you might want to go see your doctor. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so this is bad. Like there, there you go. There you go. No, you have to, to hold it like this. There you go. Did I do it wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah you wait, did. Wait, we have a prize. Oh, no, wait, a surprise for you. Yeah, we have a <laughs> couple of surprises. There you go. Okay, first. Your book is fun. First, I like your book. It's a great book. A little something to celebrate. Let's, uh, uh, Brian? Where's Brian? Oh, Brian. Brian, where are you? Brian. He has a little something. Brian has a little uh, something for us. Yay! Yay! <laughs> and you can have champagne now, too. Oh, yeah, that is true. Like one of the balloons. We've got... We and there's a cake. Oh. Misty, a little Misty the Cloud book. And we've got uh, some champagne for you with a, a gift boss basket. Oh, yeah. Oh, this yes. is so awesome. Yes. Congratulations, Yay. Dylan. Show her what she's oh, won, God. Brian. <laughs> Congrats. Holy moly. Yes. <laughs> so cute. Why am I getting gifts? No, there's a for the kids, Oscar. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. It's for champagne's for you. It's for Calvin and, and yeah. for Ollie. We got a little today. One's and a little toast. Brian, Brian, bring out some champagne. Where'd he go? 
Oh, he's gone. Oh, sommelier. You had to go, had to go get rusty. Okay, he champagne. doesn't have the champagne. All right. Oh, there he goes. Oh. Uh, sorry, Brian. He's, he's yeah. going to drink the home? champagne. Brian, Brian, quickly <laughs> go and do some laundry. <laughs> He's got a newborn, too, so he's always going to get done. What are you doing? Grabbing a balloon. Oh, it's a balloon. Ollie wants the balloon. Oh, there you go. Oh. We miss you, Dylan. We miss Cheers. you. Congratulations, Congratulations on the new book. Congratulations, Dylan. Cheers, Cheers, thank friend. you so much. Thanks for making this so special. There's you a bet. lot going on. But I, and thanks I for getting you. a champagne. Uh, by the way, if you're watching or listening on Sirius Satellite Radio, Misty the Cloud, a very stormy day, is out today. Yay. Craig Melvin does that all the time during Craig Melvin Reports on MSNBC at 11 o'clock. Serious Eastern. Serious Satellite Radio, Craig? He, he does That's that. true. You know why I do it? Yeah. Someone showed me the, the reading sometimes on Serious Satellite Radio. I was, like, I was like, these people need to be paid more attention to. Uh, That's right. Today's show, and don't forget today's show radio, Sirius <laughs> XM Channel 108, off the, off the rails today. at 1 o'clock. Chanel, go help Dylan. All right. I'm <laughs> coming. Chanel, please. I know. Auntie Chanel is coming. I can't wait. Craig's, right. Craig's usually used to something in a paper bag when he works it up. <laughs> Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False in narrative racism. of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Okay, there's a certain energy and electricity in the air whenever Chelsea Handler stops by. That's usually because we never know <laughs> what she's going to say. She's bringing that spark to audiences for years, and she's had her own late-night show. She's written six best-selling books, and recently she launched an advice podcast on iHeartRadio called... Dear Chelsea. Yeah, now Chelsea is back where audiences first fell in love with her on the stage. And she stopped by recently to tell us all about her new comedy tour and everything else going on in her life. Do you know that we actually started drinking on this show years ago because of your book, Hello Vodka, It's Me, Chelsea? Yeah, uh, <laughs> not only do I know that, but I take a lot of pride in that. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure. I'm bringing Aiden alcohol forget. to morning television is something that I take very seriously. No, really, they should put that in your open. Yeah. Right? You know? Not your that, not that we, we want that to happen. Uh, okay, a lot of people gained some weight during COVID. Some of us learned to bake bread. Yeah, yeah. Most of us just sat around sat and watched around. You know, Netflix. television. Yeah. You fell in love, little Missy. I did, little Missy. I did. I'm in love, and I'm just and just can't shut up about it. <laughs> so wait, okay. So you, this is weird because this is somebody who you've known for a long, long time. Uh -huh. You never even looked at him that he could possibly be uh, any kind of a romantic interest, and then there he was. Well, yeah, there he was. I think he thinks that we. He his narrative <laughs> is that I we had a mutual crush on each other for a very long period yeah. of time. I don't remember that. <laughs> I remember feeling he had a crush on me, but now I do have a crush on him, and the feelings have been reciprocated. So just, I don't know what happened. You know, I think it was therapy. I went to therapy, yeah. and I was able to see things with a different lens. Mm -hmm. And then I had this great guy in my life who just kind of, you know, wore me down. <laughs> and then I capitulated, and I was like, you know what? You're my boyfriend. I love you. So it's kind of the best kind of thing, you know? He's my best bud, and uh, well, yeah. Chemistry, how does that, how do you go from just being friends for so many years to actually feeling like a spark of something. I have to be honest with you. I think you have to be healthy. Like I had no. to get myself healthy on the inside and then you attract a healthy, you know?
know? Like I was attracting unhealthies because I wasn't ready. Yeah. And so I had to kind of do that inner work, which sounds corny, but it's really necessary for everybody. Yeah. And then and then it was he was around all the time. And I mean, I would have had to be blind not to see him. You know, he was just so cute. All the things he did, I was like, this guy really cares about me. And then oh. when someone cares about you so much, mm -hmm. you just, you're like, mm -hmm. I, I like this. <laughs> I like this a and lot. It's healthy. Yeah. And y'all are touring a little bit together. You're on tour, he's on tour. Every once in a while, you kind of do it together? Or yeah. what? Oh, oh, I didn't hey, mean it like that. This is a, this is a morning, sissy. I knew you this were is a morning show. Sissy. You guys tell me not to say First things, all, and then you, you go and you can explain why you guys there. call each other sissies in case people aren't into your relationship oh. for many years. She has sissies. I, and Barbara yeah. and it's, she. We just we oh, I sort of fight Barbara and I over you. Over me, right? Yeah. And like, well, you should because last summer I spent a lot more time with her than I did with you. So you should be very jealous. We were doing Pilates and all sorts of things. Who's your bestie? No, that is so rude. to know. Don't try and do that, Hoda. This is so you, always trying to create a chasm between people. I won't allow it. That is really hot. No, it's not at all. But okay. But to answer your question, yeah, yeah. he's on his tour. I'm on my, I'm on my vaccinated and horny tour. Okay. And um, I'm glad you threw that in there. Yes, yes, of course. It's early morning television. I want to make sure I get it all in. And uh, and then sometimes, like last night in D.C., I did a surprise set at his show. Oh, that's um, cute. Yeah. So we kind of are pop you, in at each other's shows when we can, but we're usually on tour at the same time. So are you yeah. getting married? Is this like a real? Wow. Oh. No, I don't know. People want to know. Yeah, I don't know that. that I'm the married kind oh. you know I feel like I who knows I doubt it but usually when I say I'm not gonna do something I end up doing it like the next weekend so I'm not gonna say that anymore um, I, I love that we keep just showing this picture of y'all kissing, kissing. It's hilarious. <laughs> okay wait so what was it like to get back up on stage yeah oh my god so much fun I'm doing two shows at the beacon this weekend oh, in New York City here I'm doing oh. Albany um, but it's <laughs> you were so crazy. that's the Santa Barbara ball I mean I was bouncing off the walls oh you know? my god it's so nice to be the reason that oh, uh, fun. people are coming back <gasps> together. It's so nice to be the reason that for people for the first time are in large audiences. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I take it as a responsibility to bring joy and laughter during this really kind of depressing time yes. that we've all been through. So. If we're not laughing about it, you know, we're, we're not. It, it's depressing. Okay, well, since Hoda asked you, like, better, who do you think is, is funnier, you or your man? Oh, God. Well, he's probably funnier. He's he really well, he's like side splitting. Like he's oh. funny, funny, funny. When you go to his show, you cannot stop laughing. Like there's accidents that happen in the audience. I also take pride when there's an accident that happens in my audience. But uh, yeah, he gets people rolling, you know? Um, so I'll give him credit for that out of respect for my man. Oh, I love that God. you said that. Chelsea, All right. we love you. So this weekend, as Chelsea said, she'll be performing at the Beacon right here in New York City. We know what we're going to be doing. How did you love interviewing Chelsea Handler? What did you think you of her? Know, did you know that Chelsea Handler and Jenna and Barbara are all call each other sissy? We're in a fight. That's the, what? We're in a fight over Chelsea's affection. Yeah. And I think Barbara, uh, she didn't say this yesterday. <laughs> but she inferred. She basically inferred that Barbara's winning. Yeah, Barbara is winning because she texts with Barbara more than with you. But they all call each other sissy, and um, I love Chelsea Handler. And I felt like you knew the answers to the questions before she answered them because your friends are in. Well, we, but also I don't think people really understand Chelsea Handler. Yeah. Like I think they think of her comedy from before, like, yeah. kind of biting and, yeah, and she's super edgy. Yeah. She's actually also a really wonderful girls' girl mm -hmm. and a wonderful friend. And I, she was like. Um, incredible to her staff. Mm. She would, would take them on vacation. She just was beloved. And so I think people don't really know her. And we're about to, there's a whole new side of Chelsea too. She's in, in love. love. And I she know. said she went to tons of therapy because she said, like you cannot find someone to love if you're not sorted out. So she sorted herself out and then fell in love with a guy who she's known for for more than 10 years. And he always kind of loved her, which yeah. we just love that. Yeah, mm. story we love love. Coda, it sounds like you're her honorary sissy now too. I'm trying to, you should, you just, I'm trying to horn <laughs> my way in. Did you talk about that yesterday on the radio? Did you try to get her? Over your side? She wouldn't give me her cell phone number. Well, you know what? She's going to watch this on today all day. Well, she said no. I just inferred. <laughs> Big, big show for you tomorrow. Two guests who are like today's show family will be stopping by. That's right. Martha Stewart with a few delicious dessert recipes to share. And our buddy Jimmy Fallon. Jimmy. He's going to hang with us. All right. Make sure to tune in tomorrow. It's going to be a good one. Have a great Tuesday.
Welcome to Today All Day. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll be sharing some of my favorite interviews with you. These conversations include lessons from dads across the country, inspiring stories of hope, and a few laughs along the way as well. So sit tight, get ready for more. Today All Day, right now. John, what's the secret? How do, how do, you, how do you rear a daughter to become a U.S. Olympian? I talk to her, I motivate her, but the real secret is, I think it's her. I think she's pretty natural. She will be the first Hmong American to be in the Olympic. So I am proud, the family's proud, all oh, the community is very proud of her. 18-year-old Sunisa Lee, or Suni for short, secured her spot on the U.S. Olympic gymnastics team, finishing second behind only Simone Biles at trials in late June. Sunisa Lee! And her biggest cheerleader, her dad, John, is still letting that moment sink in. It's unreal, you know, because yeah, especially in gymnastics where, you know, there's only four spots available, so if she made it, and that's pretty tough. Tough determined, resilient, qualities that don't just describe Suni's journey to making the Olympic team, but traits she learned watching her dad heal. In August of 2019, just two days before Suni competed at nationals, John fell off a ladder helping a neighbor trim a tree. Now, paralyzed from the chest down, John is slowly relearning how to move. My hands are getting stronger. My balance is not so great, but I I'm learning how to cope with that. John finds inspiration from his daughter. You got this. Thanks. John, what's the secret? How do, how do, you, how do you rear a daughter to become a U.S. Olympian? I talk to her, I motivate her, but the real secret is I think it's her. I think she's pretty natural. And from an early age, Suni's energy and talent were hard to ignore. You know, the, the first year when she competed, she won state. And then the second year, they, they jumped her three levels. We just continue pushing her, helping her, supporting her. I understand that when she was sort of starting out, that her dad was so committed to her success that he actually built a beam in the backyard. Is that true? Yes, it is, and it's still here. Matter of fact, it's in the backyard right now. Why'd you do that? You know, she goes to the gym and she practiced, but we don't have a beam here, so I couldn't afford a real beam, so I built the one. Small moments that led to Suni living her dream. You know what I wanted to do before I got hurt? I always told Sunisa, if you make it to the Olympic, I'm gonna run out there and do a backflip. <laughs> but I can't do it now. <laughs> Maybe not a backflip, but you could do some serious high-fiving, right? Yes. The Lee family also can't travel to Tokyo because of COVID restrictions. So we'll watch from their hometown in Minnesota. As I watch her, I'll be thinking if she bring home a couple of medals and hopefully a couple of gold, I mean, that would be so great for the family, the community, and for the USA. Do you get nervous watching SUNY? I do. In, deep inside me, I do get a little nervous, especially when she does the beam, because that platform is very narrow and it's, it, it's high. But she's been doing it for so many years now. I mean, how, how can you still get nervous? Everybody gets nervous when a kid gets up, up on those events. Once they're done, then you, you get relieved. You think this, she'll compete again after this, or do you think this will be her first and her last? She really want to do college gymnastics. So after the Olympic, you know, she only got three more years before the next Olympic. I was hoping that she continue on, but that she want to go to college and compete. There is one thing that's for certain. We will all be cheering her on as she goes for gold in Tokyo. She already proved to the community, her family, her friends, and her coach that she is capable of getting there, so now it's time for her to go and, and uh, do it for herself. 
Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's principal of the year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. My wife is an Air Force officer. My wife is a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. My name is Reggie Brown, and this is Captain Adair Brown. As I understand it, you're an Army husband. I am. How difficult has that been? When one's in the Army, your whole family serves. Do you think that, as a society, we fully appreciate that? I feel like there's a lack of understanding of certain parts of it. Like, you take something like a deployment. Most people think deployment is war zone, bullets flying, the whole nine. But a deployment is mental, emotional separation from the things that matter to you the most. And that can be here, stateside, that can be overseas. Jeremy Hilton has had his own share of emotional turmoil as a home front dad. My wife, Renee, is a special agent for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations. Renee had actually responded September 11th at the Pentagon, and then we decided to have a child not long after that. And in November 25th of 2002, Kate was born. Kate, their first daughter, was born with a condition called hydrocephalus. She would require many surgeries and years of therapy. Jeremy decided to leave his position in the Navy to care for his daughter while his wife, Renee, stayed in the Air Force. A year later, Renee deployed to Kuwait. I was a brand new caregiver trying to figure out how do I do this by myself? Okay, we need to see the neurologist, we need to see the neurosurgeon, we need to see the developmental pediatrician. All the while, you know, I'm hearing about what my wife Renee is doing downrange and I'm worried about her and she's worried about us. Um, there's a lot of stress involved in that. To get through those difficult times, Jeremy drew strength from his own military service in the Navy. I have a child who has these needs. That's my new mission. I had a Navy mission, now I have a family mission. In 2012, Jeremy lobbied Congress for better health care and education benefits for military families with disabilities. In honor of that work, he won a prestigious Military Spouse of the Year Award, the first male spouse to ever receive it. My motto since Kate was born is, I've had these experiences, how do we make this system better for the families who come after us? Chris Field also knows his mission as a military spouse and a stay-at-home dad to four kids. For any male military spouses out there, my first recommendation is to have a sense of humor about yourself. Don't be afraid to say, yes, I'm the stay-at-home dad, and these are my kids, and this is my diaper bag. The driving kids to swim practice the washing dishes, the changing diapers, creating the conditions by which she can flourish, that's what I feel most proud of. She is an army veterinarian, but first and foremost, she's a soldier. And any day she could receive orders to go downrange and provide animal care for working dogs in the heat of battle. She is brave and tough. Captain Brown and her husband, Reggie, find solace from army life on wheels. Reggie is a professional roller skater and dancer in addition to his stay-at-home dad duties. What's your typical day look like? It's a lot. Cooking breakfast, getting clothes washed, picking them up from school. Every day is a different challenge. Do the kids appreciate the uniqueness of the situation? I think they appreciate it because they get to see 
us working together as a team, seeing us do whatever it takes to get our task, our daily task, our missions completed. How proud of this guy are you as a, as a dad? I am extremely proud by everything that Reggie is and that Reggie does for our family. It's okay. It's okay. Proud to be his wife. I'm proud to be her husband. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's just shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it? to make this trip. Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. The false narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. How did you get into sewing? It started by seeing my sister sew. She would take sweatshirts and hoodies and replace the sleeves with the African and car fabric. I was like, I think I want to do this, and then just decided to just go for it. Philadelphia native and self-taught dressmaker Michael Gardner has been sewing dresses and outfits for his nine-year-old daughter Ava since she was just three years old. You ready? Yeah. How did Daddy Dress Me uh, come about? One day, took her out and said, I'm going to take pictures of you. I mean, she just started doing poses and had a little walk, and I was like, OK, this can actually be something. <laughs> that something was Daddy Dressed Me by Michael Gardner, a fashion content brand and social media campaign featuring Michael's daughter, Ava, wearing the designs they collaborated on. Does she ever say, Dad, nah, it's not really my style? She loves everything I create simply because it's, you know, it's so dead, he's making not making her clothes. But there's a difference when I know she put something on and she connects with it in a certain way. Yeah. There's a different confidence, there's a different attitude. Michael's relationship with his daughter is much different than the way he grew up with an absent father. I would never want her to experience, you know, the pain that I had growing up without a father, not having that support that, you know, every kid deserves. But you knew your dad, right? So yeah, I knew him, but he wouldn't like acknowledge me as his son. There were times I was in front of him saying, you know, how he wouldn't speak. The trauma of not feeling worthy of his dad's acknowledgement has stuck with Michael into his adult years. That he dressed me is a way for Michael to provide his daughter Ava with a sense of strength and confidence that he missed out on in his childhood. What was your reaction when you found out that, that you were going to be a girl dad? The funny thing is I, I wanted a boy first. It makes total sense looking back on it now for me to have a daughter with how I am. You ready to do this? Yes. Michael's created more than 200 outfits for Ava over the last six years. 
His fiance Tamar recently surprised him with a poster chronicling all of his designs. She felt like I needed to see all that I had done and I just burst into tears. <laughs> Why? You get into the habit and the rhythm of just doing it and you don't necessarily take enough time to fully acknowledge what it is that you're doing. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Ava and Michael have also taken the Daddy Dress Me brand to TikTok with creative daddy-daughter dance videos. Ava, what is it about your dad that makes him makes him special? His sewing, his smile, oh. his, his care, his love. Sometimes when you're out and you guys are wearing a matching outfit, I would imagine sometimes people might ask about it. We do a lot. And what do you say? I told them that daddy made it. Ava, he told me that he also does your hair and your nails sometimes too. He just did my nails and yesterday he did my hair too. You've got a live-in fashion designer, hairstylist, and nail stylist. I feel rich. <laughs> <laughs> Which is harder, respiratory therapist or father of, of three under the age of one? Uh, option B, sir. Option B. <laughs>you got quite the, quite the busy house, I would imagine. How are things right now? Wonderful. Everybody's doing great. Um, and like you said, you know, it's pretty busy. Busy is an understatement. Adez Suleiman, a respiratory therapist at Chicago's Northwestern Memorial Hospital, found out his wife was pregnant at the end of 2019. The couple was overjoyed because they'd been trying to start a family for the last five years. Take me back. What was that like? We had a pregnancy that we've been fighting for, for forever. So we had anticipated a June baby, but then we found out some complications early uh, periods of January that, you know, we had some severe complications that might jeopardize this pregnancy. So my wife, Jennifer, was admitted in the hospital for observation. Somehow, someway, Jaden showed up, said, hey, I'm here. A little too early, a lot too early. The couple's joy was soon tempered by the fear surrounding the premature birth of their son, Jaden, born at just 23 weeks last February, just weeks before the COVID-19 pandemic began. You've got a, a brand new baby uh, who has a, a, a number of health complications. Yes. And at the same time, you're on the front lines of fighting this virus that we knew very little about at that point. Right. How were you just managing the stress of it all? Work and the family were very, very separated at that time. What I'm dealing with outside of the hospital shouldn't really affect how I'm caring for patients at the hospital. But yes, it was not going to be easy. A day visited his son in the NICU after his own long shifts at the hospital, spent working with patients on life support and putting himself at a very high risk for contracting the virus. Was I afraid and worried about taking the virus over there? Absolutely. But... Um, I still try my best to put every precaution in place, a shower, a change of clothing, and even when I get to the NICU side of things, extra gear just to have some protection to be around him. So we have a, a newborn with some health complications. Yes. We have uh, the start of a, of, of a pandemic. And then we find out we're pregnant again. Yes. Oh, and by the way, it's twins. Yes. So that did happen. Um. <laughs> the twins, Janelle and Jordan, were born December 16th, 2020, just a few months after their firstborn, Jaden, was released from his extended time in the NICU. I was elated. Uh, this was ecstasy. And this was another set of kids that I have to do everything in my power to just protect, to just cherish. Which is harder, respiratory therapist or father of, of three under the age of one? Uh, option B, sir. Option <laughs> B. I mean, I've been around here enough to where I can manage myself. But if two kids are screaming, I'm confused oftentimes. I'm trying to figure out food, diaper, what is going on. Do you have a stomach ache? You're not talking, you're just screaming. Help me out, child. The fact that all of this was going on uh, as a pandemic raged, did, did, that, did that make it maybe even sweeter for me yes having people not being able to come see their family members 
in the absolute most critical moments was pretty challenging and watching people die with no one here for them. So finding out, you know, that there's some exciting thing going on, it puts a smile on my face after every shift. Once I leave here, let me go find out about what's going on on this end of the spectrum where everything looks, you know, a little challenging, but great. This is another rainbow situation for me. So this shows that they have stuff back yet. So when the pandemic hit last spring, Dr. Michael Torre was just six months into his career in emergency medicine, working alongside his father, Dr. Paul Torre, at Houston's Memorial Hermann Hospital. He always kind of uh, seemed interested in, you know, pursuing a career in medicine. I, I never pushed him. I, I never pushed uh, any of my kids. So growing up, he kind of would kind of talk medicine here or there, you know, just high school, college, he would say things, how he had did this, did that, and we always thought it was cool. When I started doing emergency medicine, then we could really talk very specific about what's going on, what we're doing, and really, you know, connect about it. But the sweetness of reaching that career goal turned sour as the pandemic surged in the Houston area last summer, filling emergency rooms. Pandemic came six months into his career. There was a lot of fear. Am I, am I going to get this stuff and, you know, and then, you know, wind up in a box or is, you know, is it going to happen to my, my family? Pretty much every, almost after every shift, we'll call each other and be like, I did this today. Oh, yeah. Just like, I saw this today. What about you? And I think, I think that helps without really explicitly saying, you know, I need help. The father-son team was put to the test on one of their first shifts working together. There's certain things we do um, to resuscitate critical people. And we got to work on someone and help them out and, you know, do the critical care procedures that we've been trained to do together at the same time. He needed something. I just was handing it to him before he asked for it and vice versa. I needed help doing something and he was just ready right there. Medicine in general is teamwork. And when you're in one place for a while, you know, you know how your team works. And this is our first time working together. And it just, it was teamwork like we've been doing it for years. But we have. <laughs> Dr. Justin Reed, a resident physician at St. Joseph's Medical Center in Mishawaka, Indiana, and the father of five, had a busy life before the pandemic hit, but it was nothing compared to what his family has endured this past year. You know, I get home, everything was going directly into the, the washing machine, and then I was going to shower. You know, my kids are waiting for me when I come home, excited to see me, want to jump on me, tell me about their day, but we weren't allowing it. Acknowledging the psychological strain of the pandemic on his team, Justin's supervisor asked him to write a short essay about how he was coping. At a loss for words, Justin decided to make a drawing instead. It's me outside of a, a glass window, kneeling down, reaching out my hand to, to my son. And then in the background, I've got uh, flaming arrows sticking out of me. It just kind of captured the way I was feeling at the time. And, um, and I think the way a lot of us were feeling. Tragedy struck the family in December when Justin's father-in-law and grandfather both contracted COVID-19. His father-in-law suffered a COVID-induced stroke from which he is still recovering, and his grandfather fell victim to the disease. The pair said goodbye to each other via iPads from separate hospital beds. Grandpa couldn't speak because he was on uh, oxygen mask, and uh, father-in-law couldn't speak because of the stroke, and so they just cried, um, and it was a pretty, pretty harrowing touching experience. Explaining it all to his five kids has been the hardest part of it all. There's been hard moments, but but overall, they just were willing to go with it. And they wore their masks. And even my five-year-old, when we go out and see somebody not wearing a mask or not wearing it properly, will point it out and say, doesn't that guy know he could catch COVID? With vaccines rolling out across the country and hospitalization rates declining, Justin is planning on making a new drawing to express the hope he's feeling now. But this time, walking through that door and picking up and holding my son with my mask in my hand instead of on my face and with a sticker that says I got vaccinated. That's the feeling that I have now and, and grateful to be on this side of it. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this gonna work or is this gonna backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.
Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Toddcast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Providence, Rhode Island Mayor, is it Jorge? Jorge. Did I say it right? Yep. Alorza and his 15-month-old son Omar are familiar faces around City Hall. So the mayor occasionally takes his son to work with him and to city events, a move that's brought praise and also raised some questions. Yeah, I, I paid the mayor a visit recently to find a little bit more. Take a look. Well, look at you. How did the child care arrangement here at City Hall come about? So I remember uh, we went to uh, see a daycare center and uh, both Stephanie and I fell in love with the place. Then at the end, they passed us the brochure and it was $395 a week. <laughs> we looked at each other and we're like, I guess not. The mayor of Providence, Rhode Island couldn't afford daycare. It's really challenging. $395 a week, that's almost $20,000 a year. That's in-state college tuition. That is. Instead of paying those high costs, the mayor enlisted Omar's grandparents who live nearby to help with most of the care during the week. But every so often, baby Omar is spotted with his father during news conferences while testifying at the State House and in mayoral meetings. Good morning, and thank you so much for joining us today. <laughs> it's tough. You have to make a trade off. Are you committed to your career or are you committed to your family? As best as possible, I try to juggle it um, so that I can see him and still do my job as mayor. Yeah. Has there been any criticism? There have been comments that if I was a woman and I was bringing my child into work, then uh, that would be seen very, very differently. But what do you say to that? I think that's true. I think there's still absolutely a double standard. And, uh, you know, the extension of that isn't, well, let's criticize Jorge the way women are criticized. It's let's not criticize women for doing it either. Yeah. Yay! <laughs> the mayor's wife, Stephanie Gonzalez, a full-time law student, had some initial reservations about baby Omar going to work with dad. I worried about what people might say, and certainly there are naysayers about whether he should be coming to City Hall or whether he should be present at meetings. But Stephanie sees Omar's time on the job with his dad as an important life lesson. It's an opportunity for him to learn that his parents are busy people, but also his parents are people who are doing really important work. Omar! <laughs> what do you say to those who have contended bringing kids into work? That's, that is a surefire way to tank productivity. I understand that. And I try not to bring my child in during, you know, Monday through Friday, normal business hours uh, very often. Sometimes I do when I'm in a pinch. I'll bring him into the office. We have a nice little basket of toys so he knows his little station and he knows how to play. The mayor is not the only politician taking his baby to work. D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser takes her daughter to events. Illinois Senator Tammy Duckworth took her 10-day-old baby to the Senate floor to cast a vote last year. And Massachusetts State Legislator Dan Cullinane bottle-fed his baby while testifying for his district earlier this month. What do you want other dads to take away from, from this? It's not just about taking them and, you know, the swing set and the playground on weekends. It's about being an active, engaged parent throughout. Omar, when you grow up, do you want to be mayor? You should see his little wave. He has a little He's mayor wave already. already. Uh huh. Do you occasionally get a, uh, yeah, hey, mayor, it's good to see you. 
Where's Omar? Oh my God, I get Where's that Omar? all the time. <laughs> Sometimes I walk into places and say, you know, I'm here too, folks. <laughs> ah, that's funny. Uh, baby Omar, by the way, took his first steps there inside wow. the mayor's wow. office. So, according to the Parenting in the Workplace Institute, more than 200 employers across this country offer Bring Your Baby to Work programs. Every now and then, you walk around our newsroom here. Oh, sure. Hey, Today All Day, we've got a great show for you on this Tuesday morning. Dylan Dreyer joins us to talk Rusty the Baby and her new children's book, Misty the Cloud. But let's kick it off with Popstar. We have an exclusive first look at J.K. Rowling's new book, The Christmas Pig. Best time of the day! <laughs> Popstar, oh, baby! Well, we want to say good morning to Chanel. Good and morning, also we're going to talk to, I mean, Dylan Dreyer has got yeah. a new book, yep. Baby yeah. Rusty. Mm -hmm. There's Dilly. We're going to oh, talk to them in a minute. She looks so good. There's I know, that's the tease. There you uh, go. First up, though, on Pop Start, Timothy Chalamet, the actor known for starring in films like Little Woman and Lady Bird, sharing a first look at his next role as Willy Wonka. Chalamet giving fans a peek at his look from the upcoming movie musical titled Wonka. The film is a prequel oh, wow. focusing on a young Willy Wonka and his adventures that leads up to opening the chocolate factory. Oh. Chalamet writing, the suspense is terrible. I hope it will last. <laughs> he, of course, takes on the role made famous by former Willy Wonka's Gene Wilder, the best. That debuted in 1971. Mm -hmm. yes. Still one of the best movies of all time. Donnie Depp remade it in 2005. And in keeping with the tradition set by previous films, Wonka will feature original new music. In a recent interview with Time Magazine, Chalamet revealing that he spent a weekend at London's Abbey Road recording studio working on the soundtrack. Wonka set to premiere in 2023. Great casting on that. Next up, J.K. Rowling, the Harry Potter author, is celebrating Christmas early this year. Rowling out with a new book today titled The Christmas Pig. It's the story of a boy who loses his beloved toy pig on Christmas Eve. And with the help of his replacement toy, goes on an adventure to find it. Rowling sharing how her own son experience inspired the story. He had this grubby little pink pig, which he still has, out, but which was always getting lost, just like Jack in the story. He was constantly hiding this pig. And I became panicky that one day he was going to lose this pig for good. So I bought a replacement and I hid it in a cupboard. I kept thinking about what it would be like to be the replacement toy, the second pig. And out of that grew the story of the Christmas pig. Wow. Mm. To hear Aww. more of J.K. Rowling on the new book, The Christmas Pig, you can head over today to today.com. And finally, today also marks the release of our very own Dylan Dreyer's yeah. first children's book, hey. Missy the Cloud, a very stormy day. And in honor of the big occasion, we've got the author on the line. <laughs> Dilly Dilly, you Dilly. are a tough looking boy. We got you. We'll, we'll start plugging your book in a second. Let's get to the good stuff. How is Baby Rusty? <laughs> Baby Rusty is, I mean, he's a, a dream. It makes Ollie look so difficult because this baby literally just sleeps and eats all day long. Mm. And it's no problem. I'll, I mean, Oliver's Aww. the one I've been <laughs> struggling with at this point. But, um, I mean, bringing him home to the boys, that Calvin is absolutely obsessed. Like, it's hard to find a picture where Calvin isn't hugging him or kissing him or laying on top of him. So um, it's it's just been a really, really special time. I that, love that. That raises the question how Ollie feels. Yeah. <laughs> Ollie was the, the king of the castle. Now he's the middle guy. Yeah. <laughs> he was. Ollie, I mean, Ollie wasn't a baby for that long before we just bring home another baby. Mm. So he's he's adjusting. Um, he doesn't really understand the word gentle. <laughs> so um, we're, we're trying to teach him that word. Um, there's a lot of jumping on the couch. So we have to we have to keep the baby away from the couch or else he's just going to get stepped on and, at this point. <laughs> and really quickly, Dylan, how are you? I mean, we haven't lost sight of the fact that you had this little guy almost two yeah. months early. Yeah. And, yeah. and now he's home. You've got a party of six if you include Bosco. If you include Bosco. Yeah, you know, the. the the running joke was I didn't think I was going to last till my due date because I, I felt huge this time around, although I didn't really think he'd come six weeks early. But I have to say, um, I was at New York Presbyterian of Lower Manhattan mm -hmm. and the, the NICU team, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it actually made everything so much easier because they put the baby on the schedule. They, you know, had the baby the first few nights, so I got to sleep. He stayed there for a week, so I got to sleep. Mm -hmm. So in a weird way, it was almost like he was taken care of and I didn't Aww. have to do all the work the first, you know, those first two weeks that are the hardest. So, um, I mean, and, and now he's thriving. I feel great. I mean, I mean, and you right didn't now. have to be pregnant for six more weeks. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I know. Know. Every woman that knows that's pretty good. Exactly. Hey, Dylan, congratulations on a lot of things. By the way, Haley's having withdrawal from not seeing Calvin Aww. and not seeing you, but <laughs> we do have your book.
Oh. Misty the Cloud, it is already a favorite in our house. You have been waiting oh. to give birth to this book for a long time. <laughs> the, oh, the moment oh, is yes. here. I know, they're crazy about it. But tell us what it feels like to finally have this book out in the universe. Well, I, I honestly didn't think I, I would be home promoting this book because, I mean, this book was supposed to come out in September. So everything just kind of mm -hmm. changed. Um, but I mean, this is literally something my husband Brian and I worked on for 10 years. It was just this little idea. You know, you look up at the sky, and, you, and at least me, maybe because I'm a meteorologist, I don't know. But I look up at the sky and I imagine, what if there's a world up there? What mm. if these clouds are doing things? You know, when you used to be scared of thunder, your parents always told you it was the angels bowling or something, you know. But what if there was this world up there? And then it just kind of... It, it, our imagination just ran wild because I realized how many emotions are tied to the weather. You know, mm -hmm. you wake up, it's cloudy. It kind of makes you feel a little grumpy or a thunderstorm makes you reminds you of being angry or a sunny day brings a smile to your face. Rainbows bring a smile to your face. You know, so there's there's so many parallels between the weather and your feelings that I, I thought this would just be a perfect way to introduce kids to the weather without throwing it in their face and just just making it fun for them and and it's something they can always look up at and, and just kind of daydream a little bit well I've, I've thumbed through it Dylan it's it's a great read mm -hmm. but the illustrations are fantastic as well beautiful yeah Rosie Butcher is our illustrator and I mean because this is a book I've had in my head for so many years I was very particular about the illustrations and she just somehow brought my imagination to life she just totally nailed exactly what I imagined these clouds look like and I mean even the science in the back of the book I, I tried to you know not put too much science in the story itself so it could be more yeah. of a, an emotional story but then in the back of the book you have you know, some, some weather terms, why thunderstorms happen, why warm air rises and cold air sinks. And I mean, even that kind of stuff, Rosie was able to, you know, just put in a way that makes hopefully science fun for kids. Hey, did, did you, have you done the thing that I think if ever, every author's honest, they do, and walk into a bookstore to see it on the shelves? I know I've done that. I, so. It came out today, so I haven't had a chance yet, but I did order myself a copy on Amazon. <laughs> I mean, they sent me two big boxes of books, but I wanted to see what it would be like to actually open That's the awesome. envelope. And Dilly. bam, there she is. I'm just mm -hmm. so excited. The book looks great. It's a long read. I'm going to wait for the movie, but <laughs> have you, have you read it? There is an audio version of that one. <laughs> have you read it to the boys? What do they think of Misty? Oh, I, yes. I've read it so many times, it's almost memorized to this point. Calvin was actually... Um, you know, part of the, the he, he helped me write the whole thing because every time he didn't understand something, here's Brian pretending what? to respond. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 nice. Mr. Attention <laughs> Span. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, he's, he's teaching the kids young. But Calvin, you know, anything he didn't understand, we'd change it. Anything he thought was funny, we kept in the book. You know, he was, he was kind of my, my, Co-editor on this whole yeah. thing. Oh, well, congratulations on both Dilly, birthing projects. You. Yeah, it's so good to see you. You look great. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I miss you, too. Dilly will be back in the third hour. You can find more about the book, Missy the Cloud, at today.com. Love you, Dilly. Talk to you later. Up next on Today Talks, Al chats with 18-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg to see about what she wants to happen now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get in. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's principal of the year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Welcome back today on the third hour. Al sits down with 18-year-old activist Greta Thunberg for our series Today Climate. Take a look. We are back with our series Today Climate. At just 18 years old, Greta Thunberg is arguably the face of the climate movement. I got a chance to speak with her about the action she wants to see now and her hope for our planet's future. People united will never be defeated. Hope is this. Hope is us, the people. Hope is when people gather to make change. Climate activist Greta Thunberg is back. After holding rallies virtually for more than a year, She's taking to the streets once again, challenging world leaders. Build back better, blah, blah, blah. Green economy, blah, blah, blah. Net zero by 2050, blah, blah, blah. Net zero, blah, blah, blah. Climate neutral, blah, blah, blah. Thunberg's Fridays for Future marches resumed last month and are gaining momentum ahead of the United Nations Climate Change Conference, known as COP26, later this month. If you could fill in the blah, blah, blah. Uh, what words would you want to hear from these leaders? Uh, I mainly wouldn't want to hear words because we've heard many words, but as it is now, these words aren't really leading to anything. In 2019, Thunberg grabbed the world's attention by sailing to New York City on an emissions-free, solar-powered racing yacht to attend the United Nations General Assembly, giving what became one of the most memorable speeches in UN history. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. You say you hear us and that you understand the urgency. But no matter how sad and angry I am, I do not want to believe that. Because if you really understood the situation and still kept on failing to act, then you would be evil and that I refuse to believe. The then 16-year-old was angry that promises made in the 2015 Paris Climate Agreement were not being met, namely by the U.S. and China, who are responsible for 80% of global emissions. What would you say is the price of waiting as opposed to globally trying to take action, no matter how small or large? I think that already we are seeing devastating effects of inaction and of waiting. And if we continue to wait, that will only get worse. These damages will be irreversible. The UN says global warming has already pushed our planet into a code red for humanity. And Greta is challenging more than 100 countries to renew their vow to reduce carbon emissions by 2030 and actually fulfill those promises. What do you think it is going to take for that change to happen? It's, it's a very big task that's ahead of us. We need to, to change social norms. One thing that it will take is honesty. We need to be honest about what we are doing and we need to be brave because if we do not start to treat the crisis like a crisis, then the people around us will not understand that we are in an emergency. So it's going to wow. be interesting. Uh, President Bla Biden has uh, pledged to make a major reduction in U.S. greenhouse emissions in order to eat, meet the coal of the Paris Climate Agreement. Uh, but, you know, you've got other countries, China yeah. being the, one of the other major ones that needs to make those those uh, reductions as well. So it's going to be kind of interesting. And, and we conducted this uh, interview as part of NBC News partnership with covering climate now. That's very good. She, she always brings it home. It's something else this morning I wanted to show you guys that brings it home for me. This side by side of what the Santa Monica Pier is going to look yeah. like in a not even in 100 years by 2100 so in our Wait, children's what? lifetime yes. they say correct me if I'm wrong Al but if we continue on the trajectory yeah, of if this, this is, emissions it, if this is a 3 degree uh, temperature rise okay. uh, this is what the Santa Monica Pier will look like wow. at 2100 this 2100. is the, the, the lifetime yeah. of kids living today yeah so all those all is, businesses and homes, yeah, because of uh, because of, of ice cap melt. That puts it in so, perspective. So if you go on the Climate Central website, they have a, a number of those those comparisons. New York City, Washington D.C. Mm. I grew up going out there. It's a, yeah. it, it gave me the chills wow. to see that. Yeah. yeah.
Thank Those you are the kind that. of things I think it, that will resonate because I think sometimes people almost lose sight of it. You almost hear climate change, and there are some like Greta who like take it seriously, exactly. and then others just kind of say, okay, let me just recycle that and yeah, keep but, it moving. But it's so much and more it's, than it's that. It's already happening in cities like Miami, places like that where you have uh, you know blue sky flooding because of high tides, winds, and sea level rise. It's good. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, it's one of your favorites, Tuesday, Tuesday. Stay with us. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today on Hoda and Jenna, Texas A&M kicker Seth Small scored the game, winning field goal over the weekend against Alabama. But the 21-year-old college senior isn't the only one enjoying his newfound fame. His family is going viral after they were filmed celebrating in the stands. Take a look. This is a kind of a special Tuesday. It's a Tuesday Tuesday. You know, usually we um, have a viewer will pick our outfits or in some cases like Rent the Runway yes. did it. This is the very first time that we are choosing outfits in this way. Okay, I know. And we're a little nervous a about little it. A little bit, yes. Because the men of today's show, Al, Craig, and Carson, are picking what we wear. Okay. Now, they wanted to go, they said, with a comfort look. Okay. I kind of already like the idea. Okay, so here's what they picked. Are these for me? For Hoda. Okay, so Al a picked a, a denim jumpsuit. Yes, I did. Oh! So tell us about. Well, it, Al. I, I just kind of like the 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 Al. Uh, <laughs> Deborah wears a lot these a lot, and what's great is they're comfy. They're kind of chic. <laughs> and once you're done the, with the show, uh, you can change your differential fluid in the car. So, yeah, which, which, is, which is nice, you know? It's, it's, it's a little forgiving if you've had a, a you know, kind of a tough night. I like it. Little, you know, but it still is there. It's, Unlike the Craig, which yes. it doesn't leave much to the imagination. Right, that's I mean, a what's form that? fitting. That's this is what Craig fitting. wants to see you in. Are you, I've seen, are you really? Bobby? I've actually seen Craig in this. <laughs> And uh, the Carson. And, lastly, and the Carson, which I, I like could see that. Jill Martin wearing, you know, uh -huh. and could see any one of you wearing. But you've worn things like this. This. <laughs> this. Selling the out. Look, you're actually body blocking the Craig. I know. Is that a this purpose? This is fantastic. Um, I do like the Carson, I have to say. Okay, Al, what, ab what about my okay, options? Okay, let's go to Jenna's Okay, options. let's go to Jenna's options. The you Again. Again. <laughs> both get voted for we wear the same yes. yes we wear the same thing. yes okay that's hilarious yes now the craig that's cute is the, uh, actually you're kind of wearing something like yeah. this right now well, well Hoda Hoda is. is oh so oh, yeah. there's that uh and and the carson oh. is uh if you just 
if you just put a flame under this, it balloons out and you can go to the Arizona Arizona Hot Air Balloon Festival. So that that's that's not really flattering. flattering. That's not flattering that for anybody. That's really flattering. But this, everybody looks great in this. Everybody. Wow. The fact that everybody. you picked the same thing for oh, Everybody oh, looks good in this. Just I saying. What a Goodbye. Legend. So long. Okay. Well, Al sold it. You know what I love about Al when he wants something? I know. What if we're both wearing, wearing that, that outfit? jumpsuit? It's which, cute. It's cute. Wow. Could, we okay. could both wear that. We could both wear it. Okay. That'd be a little weird to match exactly the same. Okay. But, you the know. Craig, there's the Craig and there's the Carson. And there's the Al, the Craig, and the Carson for Jenna. Okay. okay. I think it also tells um, us what they want to see us in. That's kind of interesting. I'm confused. I'm a little confused by Carson's. I have yeah. to be honest. You are. Are you? I don't. I don't know. I think Carson's eclectic. Okay. All right. So. There was a, okay, so anyone who loves college uh, football knows that Alabama was upset yes. on, over the weekend. Texas A&M, I mean, Alabama's a powerhouse. Yes. They almost never lose. No, and in fact, never. I'm kind of tired of it. I hate to say it because we love all of y'all down in Alabama. Roll Tide. But they have been winning year after year. I know. Well, and it almost is like second nature, but something did happen. So it was a big moment for a kicker from Texas A&M. His yeah. name is Seth Small. He stepped up to make the kick. This was it. This was all the beans. This is for everything. There he goes. And he made it. And won okay. the game. Yeah. Okay, but what was even more exciting? That yeah. was an awesome moment. But what was even more exciting is to see the reaction of Seth's family, including his wife Rachel, to the game winning field goal. Let's take a look. moments like this. Wow, I'm overcome by what's happening. Wait, what is happening? What is happening? You know what? It was like you could we all felt her. We were like, how about when she just hurled right over? She was like, nothing is going to stop me from my man. You see chest moving oh, out God. and in. Oh, my God. That, that was, was amazing. <laughs> what All right, is so. happening? Rachel said she's still trying to wrap her head around the whole night. Oh, and wow. Seth's probably still pinching himself, too. I just loved what it is. I don't know if that was babe. his dad. Like, she was like, but babe. what about his dad? Just yeah. like, oh, Ooh. God. I know in the, all of those, I think those are siblings and, and other else. It's like, she was like, babe. 47. Look, holy babe. hands. Look, wait, the holy wait, hands. Wait, 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 wait. Let's go. She's <laughs> Babe, I like babe 47, you babe 47, you you're her babe and number 47, 47, oh god, she's hyperventilating, okay, I'll watch it again, oh god, you got it, oh my god, wow, oh, oh my god, okay, wow, that was, we really love that, that was, Awesome. I, love, I could watch I'm that a, Texas, a thousand times uh, a over. A UT fan. Yeah. And UT and the Aggies used yeah. to kind of have a rivalry, still, although they cannot, moved. There's but, only one side of that story. Right? Well, <laughs> right? yes, except Unless for. Unless you're Alabama. Well, and then there was another side. But it was true, beautiful. But it, that was a beautiful moment. We just love Rachel. Yeah. Okay. Those, by the way, being that kicker in that moment is a lot. Ugh. It's a lot. But anyway, it did great. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it? to make this trip. Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate, is this gonna work or is this gonna backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. 
Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night. It's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Okay, there's a certain energy and electricity in the air whenever Chelsea Handler stops by. That's usually because we never know <laughs> what she's going to say. She's bringing that spark to audiences for years, and she's had her own late-night show. She's written six best-selling books, and recently she launched an advice podcast on iHeartRadio called Dear Chelsea. Yeah, now Chelsea is back where audiences first fell in love with her on the stage, and she stopped by recently to tell us all about her new comedy tour and everything else going on in her life. Do you know that we actually started drinking on this show years ago because of your book, Hello Vodka, It's Me, Chelsea? Yeah, <laughs> not only do I know that, but I take a lot of pride in that. Okay. Yes. I just want to make sure. Uh, bringing Aiden alcohol forget. to morning television is something that I take very seriously. No, really, they should put that in your open. Yeah. Day, you know? Not that, we're, not that we, we want that to happen. Um, okay, a lot of people gained some weight during COVID. Some of us learned to bake bread. Yeah, yeah. Most of us just sat around sat and around. watched you know, television. Yeah. You fell in love, little Missy. I did, little Missy. I did. I'm in love and I'm just and just can't shut up about it. <laughs> So wait, okay, so you this is weird because this is somebody who you've known for a long, long time. Uh -huh. You never even looked at him that he could possibly be uh, any kind of a romantic interest, and then there he was. Well, yeah, there he was. I think he thinks that we, he, his narrative <laughs> is that I we had a mutual crush on each other for a very long period yeah. of time. I don't remember that. <laughs> I remember feeling he had a crush on me, but now I do have a crush on him, and the feelings have been reciprocated. So just, I don't know what happened. You know, I think it was therapy. I went to therapy yeah. and I was able to see things with a different lens mm -hmm. and then I had this great guy in my life who just kind of you know wore me down <laughs> and then I capitulated and I was like you know what you're my boyfriend I love you so it's kind of the best kind of thing you know he's my best bud and uh, well, yeah chemistry how does that how do you go from just being friends for so many years to actually feeling like a spark of something I have to be honest with you I think you have to be healthy like I had oh. to get myself healthy on the inside and then you attract a healthy you know like I was attracting unhealthies because I wasn't ready yeah. and so I had to kind of do that inner work which sounds corny but it's really necessary for everybody yeah. and then and then it was he was around all the time and I mean I would have had to be blind not to see him you know he was just so cute all the things he did I was like this guy really cares about me and then oh. when someone cares about you so much mm -hmm. you just you're like mm -hmm. I, I like this <laughs> I like this a lot it's healthy yeah and y'all are touring a little bit together you're on tour he's on tour every once in a while you kind of do it together or what? Yeah. Oh, oh, I didn't mean it like that. This is a morning show. I knew this is a morning show. You guys tell it. me not to say First things all, and then you, you go and you can explain why you guys call each other sissies in case people aren't into your relationship oh, for many years. She has sissies. I, and Barbara yeah. and is, she. We just we oh, I sort of fight Barbara and I over you. Over me, right. And Well, you should because last summer I spent a lot more time with her than I did with you. So you should be very jealous. We were doing Pilates and all sorts of things. Who's your best No, that is so rude. Don't make me Don't try and do that, Hoda. I this is so you, always <laughs> trying to create a chasm between people. I won't allow it. That is really Hoda. No, it's not at all. But okay. But to answer your question, yeah, yeah. he's on his tour. I'm on my, I'm on my vaccinated and horny tour. Oh, and um, you threw that in there. Yes, yes, of course. It's early morning television. I want to make sure I get it all in. And uh, and then sometimes, like last night in D.C., I did a surprise set at his show. Oh, um, yeah, so we kind of are pop in at each other's shows when we can, but we're usually on tour at the same time. So are you getting yeah. married? Is this like a real? Wow. Oh. No, I don't know. People want to know. Yeah, I don't know that. that I'm the 
marrying kind. Oh. You know, I feel like, I, who knows, I doubt it. But usually when I say I'm not going to do something, I end up doing it like the next weekend. So I'm not going to say that anymore. Um, I, I love that we keep just showing this picture of y'all kissing. kissing. It's hilarious. <laughs> okay, wait. So what was it like to get back up on stage? Yeah. Oh, my God. So much fun. I'm doing two shows at the Beacon this weekend oh, in New York City here. I'm doing oh. Albany. Um, but it's <laughs> you were so crazy. That's the Santa Barbara Bowl. I mean, I was bouncing off the walls. Oh you know? my gosh! It's so nice to be the reason that oh, uh, fun. people are coming back <gasps> together. It's so nice to be the reason that for people for the first time are in large audiences. Mm -hmm. And you know, I take it as a responsibility to bring joy and laughter during this really kind of depressing time yes. that we've all been through. So. If we're not laughing about it, you know, we're, we're not, it, it's depressing. Okay, well, Sintota asked you, like, better, who do you think is, is funnier, you or your man? Oh, God. Well, he's probably funnier. He's he, really what? Well, he's like side splitting. Like, he's oh. funny, funny, funny. When you go to his show, you cannot stop laughing. Like, there's accidents that happen in the audience. I also take pride when there's an accident that happens in my audience. But, uh, yeah, he gets people rolling, you know? Um, so I'll give him credit for that out of respect for my man. Oh, I love that God. you said that. Chelsea, All right. we love you. So this weekend, as Chelsea said, she'll be performing at the Beacon right here in New York City. We know what we're going to be doing. Thanks for doing this, Herb. Great to see you. Great to see you. I want to tell you right out of the box, this is the highest elevation we've ever done one of these interviews. 101 stories. I've never been this high up in my life. <laughs> this is crazy. It's kind of crazy, isn't yeah. it? It's beautiful, though. We felt like it was perfect for you, given where you are right now, on top <laughs> of the game with this year you've had between oh. playing the Super Bowl and a Grammy and an Oscar. How does it feel to be in the middle of this moment right now? I don't know how to describe it. It kind of feels like this view. You know, it's like... All you can do is just sit and, and enjoy it and, and be thankful for it. Um, and that's kind of where I'm at. I'm like taking every moment, trying to seize every moment. And I know this is just the beginning, which is really like scary, but amazing in a way. So um, I'm just taking it all in. And I'm, I, I know that this is a very special, special situation. You know, I know that this doesn't happen all the time. So I'm, I'm just so grateful. So we're just a couple of days away from your 24th birthday. Yes. It's kind of crazy. I know you can't stop and let it wash over you completely because you're moving around doing so much but have you processed at all what these few months have been like and how early in your career these things have started to happen for you I guess so I, I have been thinking about it like wow and of course you have those doubts like do I deserve this you know do, do I deserve to be here and and I have to remember you know I've been doing music for my pretty much my whole life you know I've worked for so many years and then I have to give myself more credit you know I have to say you're doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing you're exactly where you're supposed to be you've worked for it and you should be proud of yourself so I've just been working on being proud of myself because of course you know when, when you create this art and you do, do these things you're you know the hardest on yourself so I'm always hard on myself but now I've really been taking in the moment to like you know, pat myself on the back. <laughs> it feels like people in the music industry and real fans of music have known you for several years, but when you stood up there during the Super Bowl and did America the Beautiful with that guitar and you were by yourself and singing and playing, I think a huge audience of football fans or you know a part of the country that maybe didn't even know who you were stopped and said, who is that? How special was that performance for you? I, it was very special and the timing I think couldn't have been more perfect because you see a young black woman, black Filipino woman up there on the stage, you know, playing electric guitar and I don't think you see that very often, you know, especially on a stage like that. So I just felt so like excited and nervous at the same time because it is, you know, one of the biggest stages ever. Um, but it was so much fun. My mom was there with me, and like I know she was super proud. So, you know, we'll be back for, for a halftime show one of these days. <laughs> you will. I, <laughs> I bet you will. I, I always think about when I see somebody singing the national anthem or just uh, being alone on a stage that big. Mm -hmm. Do the nerves come in different than other performances? Do you think, oh, there are 100 million people watching this? Oh, yeah, sometimes, <laughs> definitely, definitely. But it, it takes about like two words or a line, and then I'm, I'm in it. I'm like... I'm in the performance and I'm nowhere else. You click into that zone. Mm -hmm. It's funny, you corrected me when you were right. I almost caught myself when I said so early in your career. Your career started when you were a toddler, basically <laughs> sitting at the piano, and you were on the Today Show 
when you were 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> um, 2007, sitting in a piano in a little fur vest you had on. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and your parents were in the studio and Hoda was interviewing you and then you played Alicia Keys. Yeah. And now tomorrow, you're getting ready to go stand on that city concert stage with a big crowd mm -hmm. on a Friday afternoon. That's a kind of a crazy full circle moment. It is, it, and I, there's been tons of those full circle moments. And I think that's what really shows me that I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Um, but you know, it, like it is early in my career. It's fair to say that, you know, I'm only 23 years old. So um, I still got a, a whole lot of years of, of doing this thing, you know, to, you know, to, to be in it and, and, you know, do my thing. It's like crazy to think that I'm only 23 and so much has happened, but. And you're, it was early. And so back in your mind, I was reading, is technically your debut album. I mean, I wouldn't say... What does that mean say, exactly? Because I, we've been listening to you for years. I, don't, I wouldn't call it debut album. Okay. I would call it my first official album. Okay. Just because I've, I've released EPs before. Right. You know, it, it's only been EPs and then combined into one project. But this is my first official, you know, full body of work, like, album. And so what went into this? What was in the back of your mind? You were just saying, I've been listening to these songs on my phone for a couple of years now, yeah. and now they're out in the world. What's in the back of your mind? Um, so much, so much is in the back of my mind. I think this album is, is pieces of volume one and what got me here in the first place, you know? And it's uh, ele elevated and it's, it's the growth. It's, it's more musical. There's elements of live drums and, and you know, live, keys and, and band feels but there's also you know pieces of like more trap drums and new R&B sounds and I, I think all of that is in this project it's not just one specific period of time it's everything up until this point and you've said you're when you write a song it's sort of a another way of writing a diary almost that you Absolutely. put your thoughts down so what specifically has been on your mind for the last couple of years? What was coming out of your diary? What was coming out of my diary? It's all in the music. I'm not going to tell you because I have everything <laughs> revealed in the music. Okay, I've been listening to it, so I know. But for people who are going to go out and listen to it, how, when you decide to put out um, something this personal and an album like this, what is the process? I mean, I was, you said it's been a couple of years, but like you start with the blank page and what do you want to say? when you're putting out your your album you know it, it's moment by moment it's what do i feel today or what did i feel yesterday you know that i need to get out um on this this paper you know in this song um and, and when i do that you don't realize you're working towards a body of work you know at least i don't i don't realize that oh this is actually a story because it's my life it's just a collection of songs that represent different feelings and different moods i'm super moody so there's so many different <laughs> moods you know that go into this project and um, yeah, it's like, I went into the studio thinking, I'm just gonna make great music. I'm gonna make a good song. It doesn't matter what's in it. I don't care if it's a, a, a flute or if it's a, a trap hi-hat. You know, it doesn't matter. If it's a, great, it's a great song, it's a great song. And to me, some of the best songs sound great, you know, when they're stripped down. So if they sound good like that, then they're gonna sound good any kind of way. Um, and that's kind of what I start with. And with this project, I, I thought it's really time to make a full body of work. It's time to work towards. I had been touring from 2017 till 2019, pretty much. You know, I just was touring, so I never had time to really buckle down and like just focus in the studio on a full, full body of work. And this was this was that. One of the things I love about you is you can't put your music into a box. People want to say, what kind of music? I mean, it's R&B, yes, but it's a little bit of older blues, it's Jimi Hendrix on the guitar. So when you were growing up, I love your list of influences because I don't think most people would expect it from a kid who grew up in the 2000s talking about names like B.B. King and Hendrix and, and yeah. Prince to go along with Mariah and Whitney and mm -hmm. all the people who influenced you. So when you were growing up in your house, I mentioned you were a toddler playing the piano on your dad's lap. Yep. How did this music thing start for you? Um, it was just, it, it seemed like it was there. It was like, you know, my dad's band was playing in the living room when my mom was pregnant. So I was probably, you know, in the womb, like, <laughs> I'm going to do this, you know, like probably. Um, and, and when I was growing up, it was like, there was all kinds of music around me. You know, um, I was blessed to grow up in an extended family home where it was my grandparents that grew up in the Philippines. You know, they were in the house with us. So they were listening to Johnny Mathis and Barry Manilow and, and uh, Celine Dion. And then my mom was listening to her favorite, you know, um, R&B artists like, you know, Jodeci and, and people like that. And, and then my dad was listening to funk and James Brown and Hendrix, as well as Eric Clapton and as well 
was Ozzy Osbourne and ACDC because he was just such a guitar, you know, guy. And then my uncle was playing, you know, Aaliyah and Joe and, you know, uh, Usher and, and people like that. So I was exposed to so many different types of music and I loved it all. I loved it all because I just heard all the details, you know, of, of everything and, and I took it all in and was like, maybe I can make this, you know, and I didn't think I thought about that really, but I just did, you know, I, I just did and, and music was just something I loved. There was, it wasn't about the genre or the style, it was just, this is music. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey everybody, it's Hoda Kotb from the Today Show. I am so, so excited to tell you about my new podcast, Making Space with Hoda Kotb. I sit down with some incredible people and we'll hear some uplifting stories. Listen to Making Space now on Apple Podcasts. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get ahead. It seems to me you've always been comfortable performing. Maybe that's not true, but just watching you in that interview when you're 10 years old, yeah. the poise you had even during the interview. So you got to sit and talk to these two strangers for a while before you play this song by someone you look up to, Alicia Keys on national television. Where do you get your stage presence? Is that from your dad too? I don't know. Maybe it is. <laughs> Maybe it is, you know, my dad, he would go on stage and it would be, you know, two people in the audience and he's going crazy, you know, no matter who's in the audience or it's a hundred people at a, at a club or a festival and he's going crazy and, you know, they were, they were a cover band so they would play songs like, you know, James Brown, Get On Up and then they would play Sweet Home Alabama. Like it was, like there was no, he just had so much fun and I think maybe watching him have so much fun on stage encouraged me too. I don't know, I don't know, maybe. Was there ever a chance you weren't going to be a musician? I know you flirted with the idea of being a dentist for a little while. <laughs> when I was a kid, it was it was going to be something like probably in the medical field. You know, when you when you have an Asian mother, like the pressure of you know of the Asian family home. Sometimes it's like you know success is like you got to become a doctor or like a right. nurse. You right. know, so I think that that was that was definitely going to be in the plans. And then you know I, that didn't work out. So. I just became a musician instead. So in your heart, you knew you were going to be a musician. <laughs> I think so. I think I decided, um, you know, it was a given. But when I graduated high school, I, I really decided I'm going to do this thing 100%. I'm going to be fully invested in this. And yeah. Have there ever been, once you decided, have there been bumps along the way where you said, man, this is a tough business. I don't know how to break through. I don't know if this is going to work out. And obviously, you've overcome all that if you had it. But have you been frustrated at certain points in oh, your rise? Absolutely. Um, you know, I've been blessed with an amazing team, MBK Entertainment, who believe in artist development. And they saw me when I was on the Today Show when I was 10 years old. And, and everybody saw something in me that I don't even think I saw in myself. Mm. But I shortly after that, I got signed to um, RCA Records, to MBK RCA. And I was 14. And, you know, of course, people around you are like, oh, you're going to be a huge star. Like, right away they think that's how it works and I think I knew that's not how it works you know just because I had been exposed so young um, and watching other artists but um, of course throughout those years I'm working on my craft and I'm being patient but I'm watching so many other artists you know become successful uh, they were manage, managing um, Elle Varner and Kay Michelle and Brandy and Alicia Keys and um, Justine Skye and all these different artists and I watched them and I was on the side of the stage at their shows. I was the ones I was the one backstage cheering them on, you know, like, oh, that's gonna be me one day. But of course you get frustrated, like, when is it gonna be my turn? And of course I was working on my craft and people would say things like, oh, she's gonna get shelved, you know, she's mm. never gonna make it or she's never gonna put music out. 
And I think I just quieted all those voices and I knew, you know, what's for me is for me and, and it's going to happen when it's supposed to. And finally, as soon as I graduated high school, um, the following year in 2016, we all took a chance and um, decided it's time to release volume one and finally really, you know, be, be the artist that I'm, I'm meant to be. And the rest is history. I feel like probably for a 14 year old coming into the music industry, they might have wanted to push you in a certain direction, certain Absolutely. people, because it, I, it's got to be hard for them to even conceive of a 14 year old who wants to play the guitar like Jimi Hendrix <laughs> and have this old school, soulful sound, like how do I market that, how do I sell it? Were, was there an effort by some people to kind of nudge you in a direction other than you found yourself? I, I mean, everybody has their opinions. Everybody has their thoughts and feelings on the artist I should be. Oh, you should do songs like this. You should do songs like this. And I've tried them all. I've done everything. Because I love all types of music and I'm not afraid to, you know, challenge myself. But when it was 2016 um, and I was, or 2015 really, and I was finally finding who I wanted to be as an artist, I realized I needed to make what was most authentic to me that fit into the world of what was going on in music at the same time. You know, you never compromise yourself, but you learn. And I had to be a student of the game, a student of what was happening in music. And so I did that and I listened to a lot of artists like Drake and Janae Aiko and Bryson Tiller at the time and um, so many different artists. Um, and I really admired that sound and I thought this might be the, the, the lane, this might be the sound that I would really like to make an introduction, you know, into the world of, uh, with. And, and that, was, that was how Volume 1 came to be. So tell me about the name Her, um, because that's part of your evolution as well. Why you decided to go with that and what the significance is to you. Um, you know, with, with Her, it was like a time in my life, of course, when you're in high school and, you know, you're changing and you're going through all these things and boys and, <laughs> you know, all these things that are part of life, right? And I always watch, like, the women that I, I grew up around and um, I always said, you know, I'm not going to be like them. I'm not going to, you know, fall for the wrong guy. Like, it was like a hopeless romantic way to think. Or I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be that vulnerable and, you know, I'm going to be like this type of woman and whatever that means, you know, when I was a teenager trying to be a perfectionist. And then I realized that it's inevitable to fall for the wrong guy or, you know, to make mistakes or, you know, to, to have feelings that, that are, are, you know, valid because it's part of life. You know, it's, it's inevitable to, to go through changes as a woman and to be imperfect, you know. And, uh, yeah, I, I decided, you know, I, I really would like this music to reflect that period of time and, and all of those things. Um, and that's, that's why I decided to, to go by the name Her. And it was also a way to make people focus on the music because sometimes we listen with our eyes and not our ears, you know, and, and I really wanted the music to be the center of attention, not, you know, the, the, my, my look or how old I am or, you know, where I'm from and all of those things, what I'm wearing, who I'm dating. I, I just didn't think any of those things matter. I always wanted to get back to the art and to the music. And um, that's why I decided to just have a silhouette as a cover and for it to be called her. And do you think that has worked for you in terms of people sort of just being like, man, she can play, she can sing, and that's all I need to know about her? I think so. And I mean, I definitely think people, you know, were like, wow, the music, you yeah. know, it's all about the music. And now I feel there's an organic, you know, kind of reveal of, of me and who I am as a person and, you know, as an artist and, and you know, just a little bit more of the details, a little bit more of my face, you know, <laughs> here and there. But um, yeah, the music was the forefront and I'm, I'm happy that that's, that's the driving force here. Well, I was going to ask you about that. The new cover, we finally get to see a little of your face on a the cover. Bit, a little bit of my face. And that's by design. <laughs> Here's a little peek. Yeah, it is. You know, they say eyes are the window to the soul. My music is the window to my soul. You know, but here's a little here's a little peek into my soul. So what do you think now that you give us a little peek people should know about you that they don't know about you through all these years of listening to your music as you open yourself mm. up a little bit? That's a really good question. <laughs> I don't know. Um, that I think the major thing is like don't take yourself too seriously all the time. Really have to enjoy this. I, I find myself um, like forgetting to just be in the moment, you know, and I'm working on that. But I think people need to know that, you know, I don't take myself too seriously. I take my art and my expression seriously, but I don't take myself too seriously. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. 
Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's your shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I served an amazing group of staff and students. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. I mentioned your Grammy this year, which you won for I Can't Breathe. Yeah. Um, I was talking last week, we had Trevor Noah on the show, and we were talking about doing comedy in this year that didn't feel very funny yeah. and how you address everything that's happening in the country. So the song obviously addresses what's been happening in our country, not just for the last year, but for generations. Mm -hmm. What was it like to make music in this last year as you would watch the news or see something happening in the streets and want to have something to say about it? Yeah, it was, um, it was a tough year. I actually didn't create a lot in the first half of the year because it was just so like, I had my whole year plan, I was gonna do a bunch of shows and it all just came to a stop and that's very scary. Like, okay, we have no idea what's going on. So, um, you know, when the summer happened and the George Floyd protests were happening, of course we were all affected by it, but it was just like, like this new awareness and like this, you could not escape it. You couldn't say, oh, you know, I'll read about that article later or I'll, you know, you could not avoid it. So seeing that, um, I ended up just calling um, T.R. Thomas, who I write with all, all the time, yeah. but we're, we're friends, you know, that's like my big sister. Um, and we were just catching up. We started talking about, like, isn't this crazy? And, and she started talking about her pain, I started talking about my pain, and just, you know, just the fear that we both had. And suddenly we ended up writing a song. My guitar stays next to my, uh, my bed uh, in my mom's house, and I was at my mom's house during quarantine, and I picked up the guitar, and we, we just started asking you know, those questions, like, to ourselves, like, how do we cope when we don't love each other? What is a gun to a man that surrenders? All these things that we really felt, and um, it kind of just happened organically, and um, I ended up recording it in my, my room. You know, I was, wow. like, engineering myself, and the dogs were barking. I had to <laughs> wait for a second and then continue recording, and, um, you know, and I just felt like, wow, okay, this is something that I want to put out there because it reflected how we felt. So the song of the year was recorded in a bedroom in your mom's house. Yes, <laughs> it was. <laughs> yep, absolutely. That had to be incredibly gratifying, though, to hear your name called for not just for that song, but for what it was speaking about, oh to be the song of the year at the Grammys. You have no idea. So I, I didn't expect it to win. You know, I, I, I really didn't. I was like, oh, man, these are all amazing and you know, incredible artists. I just wrote the song in, in my room, you know? <laughs> I didn't. That's cool enough, and then you win an Oscar. Yeah, oh on my top gosh. of it. I mean, it's crazy. What was that experience? Like? I mean, the next day after winning Song of the Year, you know, they were like, the Oscar nominations are, are going to come out, and I was like, okay, well, it, it's okay if I don't get nominated. I got Song of the Year. Like, it's all good. 
got the nomination. And I'm like talking it down because I'm like, this is a huge deal, but I don't want to get, you know, I don't want to get my hopes up or anything. And we go and it's super chill and my mom's there and she's all like happy, just happy to be there. We're meeting Angela Bassett. And then, you know, Zendaya calls my name yep. and, you know, I, everything just stopped for a second. Everything just stopped. I was like, did this really just happen? Like, did I just win an Oscar? Am I an Oscar winner? <laughs> and of course, I thought about, you know, Prince winning his Oscar. I thought about like, just all of these things, um, the movie and, and the importance of that film that I was even winning for. I just felt like bigger than me. Like, oh my gosh, I'm being recognized for this specific moment, um, this, this, this movie based on an important moment in black history, which was even more rewarding, you know, to be winning an Oscar for that. So. There were all of these things going through my head, and I just couldn't even like, <laughs> couldn't even fathom, you know, what was going on. I'm sure. So in the space of a couple of weeks, you got the G and the O and the E got. We just got to get to the outside just now. Got to get to the, the E right? and the T. There's some talk that you might be doing some work on Broadway potentially. That you want to get into acting. Absolutely. Is that in your future? Absolutely. Um, I had a, a little part in the, the movie Yesterday with Jennifer Garner. Yeah. And um, I got to play myself, but I had some lines, and you know they were all like, "Wow, you, you know, you're such a natural." And I've actually loved acting for so many years, um, but music has been the main focus. So I'll definitely be on the big screen soon. I'll, I'll make some time for it. No reason you can't do both, right? Exactly. Make the most of your day with today all day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Boom. Boom. Shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Is that ready? Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? I'm curious, um, everyone seems to have a moment in their career where they feel like everything changed. Mm. Do you have one? Some people point to Rihanna posting the video with your song on in the background. That was a big moment. Was it? Yeah, that was definitely a big moment. It was like, oh my gosh, like people really listen to my music. But I, I think it's, it's not so much, you know, social media really, it is, but it's more so when I'm really with the people. You know, when, I'm, when I was on stage opening up for Bryson Tiller in 2017 in Atlanta, this was my first show you know, well, not my very first show, but my first show on a tour um, after I released my project. Um, everybody was singing the lyrics. And I was like, oh my gosh, these people know the lyrics to my songs? Like, we're all freaking out. Like, did you hear them? You know, like they were really singing along. And I knew at that point, you know, um, that I was really getting a, a, a core following, like a, a group of people that, that really love my music. And then fast forward, I'm doing a festival in Las Vegas, and there's people with cowboy hats in the audience <laughs> singing all the lyrics to my songs. And I'm like, okay, this is crazy. You know, it's so much more than I thought. But it just shows you, you know, music brings people together. And I, I didn't think I would have the, the ability to do that. But um, I, I see it and I, thought, I feel it. I thought the same thing watching you at the CMTs with yeah. Stapleton. That, that's a country audience and they were singing yeah. along and they're, they, you've got fans across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And you've been smart. You've come up in this generation where you know, you don't have to focus on the radio as much, mm -hmm. right? You can do streaming and social media. Um, does that make it easier for an artist to be able to just put your stuff out directly in some ways? Definitely. When you use social media as a tool, I think it definitely makes it easier. Like, I kind of, 
um, built this thing. We, we built this, like kind of like a rapper, you know, where you put out a mixtape yeah. and you just grind. And it was a lot of, you know, posting. And it was really word of mouth, you know, like, and then really getting on the road and just touring. I toured for like two or three years, you know, just, you know, just on the road and, and doing my thing. So, um, yeah, I, I definitely think it makes it easier and it's hard there's so much out there and you could get discouraged but when you are totally your authentic self and you put yourself out there anything is possible you know and there's somebody out there that is looking for somebody like you to look up to mm. you know so you got to tell yourself that that's a great message because I think a lot of people are trying to be something they think will be popular yeah. and people will make people like them yeah no. and you get lost doing that you, you get lost and and then you regret it because you're like why didn't I just stick to, to my guns why didn't I just be who I am you know, and that's that's part of life. We all have, you know, a hard time being who we we really are and being afraid of, of you know, standing out too much. But when you realize standing out is your superpower and that you're actually helping other people by standing out, you know, helping them be comfortable in their own skin by you being comfortable in your own skin, then then you have impact. I know you've got sound check in a few hours, basically, because <laughs> you have to get Pretty up much. so early for the Today Show. So we'll let you go. But how much fun is it going to be? Not just tomorrow morning, but this summer and into the fall to get back on a stage and just hear those audience sing your songs back to you again. I'm so excited. You have no idea. I'm like, let's, let's, all right, let's, let's get to it. Let's, let's get on the stage. No, I'm, I'm really, really excited. Um, it's been a long time and um, we've, we've lost a lot in the past year. And of course I've, I've been blessed to, to still be able to do what I'm, I do, but um, there's nothing like being in front of a real audience and having that connection. So I can't wait. Well, I'm so happy for your success. It's great to see somebody true and real and so talented succeeding the way you are. Thank so, you so much. Congrats, and we'll see you on TV at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning. Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Smell it so good. Oh, it smells like pastry. What are you doing? Um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. Hi everybody and welcome to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. I can't wait to take a look back at some of my favorite Cooking with Cal segments and offer just a few of those tips and tricks that didn't quite make it into the original episode. In today's episode, we are all about apples. Everyone in my family loves apples and I use them in so many different recipes in so many different ways. Just ask Ollie. <laughs> I love taking the boys apple picking. I don't know why, it ends up being one of the most stressful days. Um, you know, somebody has to go to the bathroom, somebody's hungry, uh, there's no parking because the <laughs> apple orchards are so crowded outside of New York City, but I am determined to always take the boys apple picking. I just think it's fun. Once you kind of go along that row and there's nobody else around for a little while and you pick the best apples, you kind of sneak a bite here and there. And the best part is I make so many different things with apples that I love bringing a big bushel of apples home and just seeing what we can do with them. For anyone else who went apple picking recently, here are two easy ways to use up all those apples. First up, my crunchy apple salad. Cal has a list of the ingredients you'll need for this recipe. So let's go through the ingredients, okay? What's in our apple salad? Apple. And zucchini. <laughs> Try again, not zucchini. Salad? So close. Celery. Celery. <laughs> and what are these? I think you know. Cranberry. You've been snacking on those since we started. Do you know what this is? A nut. It's a walnut. Walnut. And then you know this one. Yogurt. Lots of vanilla yogurt. So this apple salad is a perfect after school snack. It's a good breakfast. It's just a good all around nice healthy alternative. How's the yogurt doing? Do you want a spoon? Gross. You want to help me with the apple? Let me, let me cut it up into a smaller piece for you. You are actually eating all of my ingredients. No, not that many. Chop it up nice and small. You're doing a lot more eating than cooking. What's your favorite fruit? Apple. <laughs> I'm growing it and it's really hard. While you do that, I'm going to chop up the celery. Okay. I like to make the celery really small. Why? So that it's not too hard to chew. Hmm. 
So Kel, when I was little, yeah. I used to eat this all the time, every single morning for breakfast. Was that a long time ago? It was a long time ago. Even when I first moved to New York, I used to eat it all the time, every morning for breakfast. Yeah, that's weird. Mix it up. Yeah, mix it all together. All right, what should we put in next? How about some of these? Yeah, sure. Sprinkle those all in there. I can pour it. Okay. Perfect. And now let's chop these up a little smaller. Just rock your knife back and forth. <laughs> Look at how small I made these. Whoa. So now we got all our ingredients in here, right? And here's the fun part. There you go. This is the medium one or the biggest one? What, bowl or a spoon? Spoon. That's the small one. I have to lick it off. Did you have to lick it off? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, put the yogurt on it. <laughs> so you can add as much yogurt as you want. It's not really a measurement here. It's more just once everything is all nice and combined. Sometimes I'll add blueberries in here. Oh, I have to lick it off. Oh. I just eat it off. So that's it. Super simple, right? I usually make a big bowl of this and then just scoop it out in the morning or you can divvy it up into little Tupperware containers and it's good to go as a grab and go snack. Are we done? That's it. That's all we have to do. Are you going to taste one? I'm going to taste one too. A taste test? It's a taste test. <laughs> <laughs> and what spoon should I use? Mm. Mm. Is it healthy? It's very healthy. Up next, we are taking apples from sweet to sweeter with one of my favorite fall treats, apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. You don't want to miss this. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hand. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're going to do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life in primetime 
and streaming live. It's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get you hit. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? You believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Till and Dishes, Cooking with Cal. Today's episode is all about using a favorite fall staple, apples. Next up, Cal and I are making apple dumplings with a homemade caramel sauce. This recipe takes a bit more time, a bit more patience, but I promise it's worth it. I first saw this recipe in Better Homes and Gardens' new cookbook. So here's how to make one of my favorite fall treats. There are a lot of steps, but it's still pretty easy, okay? There's only three things. We need the caramel sauce that goes on top, We've got the apples that we're going to fill with this little filling, and we're going to wrap it in pastry dough. So let's get started. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> this is a hot apple. Sure. There we go. That's a nice apple. Let's add the water. <laughs> you can't eat everything. Pour in the sugar. Mom? Yes. Yeah. And I'm just gonna do half this cinnamon, not all of it. So I'm gonna bring this up to a boil, and this is gonna be our caramel sauce. We still have some things to do. You ready to make the filling? All right, what do you think those are? Mm -hmm. Walnuts. Walnuts. And what are those? Raisins. Raisins. And we're gonna add honey. Add a tablespoon of honey. This is going to be our filling for the apples. Dump the salt into the flour. All the salt? Yeah. Do you know what this is? Mm -mm. What do you think it is? I don't know. This is called a shortening. You want to make the shortening look like little bits of peas in here. What happens if we eat it? It would taste disgusting. Ready? Like press it down and twist. There you go. Press and twist. Press it hard. All right, now we're gonna add the half and half. Now can I pour it? <clears throat> what are we making? Apple dumplings, remember? Oh, yummy? Yeah. Is it dessert? It is a dessert. When it's done, can I eat one of it? Of course. And you? Yes. It smells so good. Oh, it smells like pastry. What are you doing? <laughs> Um, can we not put your face in the dough? I'm glad it's just us eating it. All right, here we go with our dough. Oh no, we make the hole. No, no, make a hole! Why? Because no more holes, no holes. I need you to start here. Okay. And end all the way over here. Nice! You put the apple here. Can you take a little bit of this? This is our better hiding, hiding spot. A little cinnamon sugar. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna pour the sauce over the dumplings. Carefully. Mm. Do you love it? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so if you wanna make this apple dumpling recipe right away, you might be thinking I don't have an apple core like I used, um, but there is a way you can just cut right through the apple. It's, it's tedious, I'll tell you that. In fact, I held off making this recipe until I ordered one of these. <laughs> um, wherever you get you know, kitchen supplies, it's an easy order. Just wait a couple days until it gets there. But if you don't have patience, um, just be careful. And I wouldn't recommend doing this part with the kids because you need a very sharp knife and you literally just have to cut around the core of the apple. So make sure you go all the way to the bottom. This is probably the worst part of the whole recipe, is coring the apple. Just wanna make sure we get to the other side. My kids eat a lot of apples, and whether I'm slicing them or dicing them or doing whatever it is with apples, there's just no good way to get the seeds out. But this, this works pretty well. Okay, so you can either do it that way if you don't have patience, although I think this way is the way to go. So this is what an apple core does. Basically the same thing the knife did, just in all one big swoop. Can you get it in there? Twist it, pull it up. And there you go. That was easier, right? So I'd recommend just holding off a couple days on this recipe and wait till you get your apple core. I mean, because that's perfect. So to core the apple with a knife, you wanna make sure you use a paring knife. They're nice and sharp, they're tiny. If you use anything bigger, I feel like you're gonna cut the whole apple up. Um, and a steak knife would just never work for this. So get yourself a paring knife too. <laughs> for all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. No. Fine. Yay. Let's, do the let's pour it at the same time, Alexander. Three, Three two, two, one. Whee! My name is Alexander Charbonnet, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. My name is Alexander Charbonnet. I'm seven years old, and I'm in second grade. I started cooking when I was five for my mom and my dad and my sister. I started my cooking channel two years ago when I was five. Hi guys, hi friends, welcome to my show. Kids can cook with Chef Alexander. We are making banana muffins with no egg, cause I'm allergic to egg. My egg allergy um, makes me sad, but I'm more sad because I can eat stuff like other people. Because of my allergy, I can't eat cookies or donuts or like cakes or like a lot of stuff. My mom is awesome because she makes eggless stuff like cookies, cupcakes, and regular cakes. But my mom and I bring um, treats like cookies without egg to school with me so I can enjoy it with my friends. My little sister has a peanut allergy. She can have like peanut butter and jelly. So I feel like she's a special too. My mom was the one who taught me how to cook. Um, my favorite part of cooking is I get to spend special time with my mom cooking. My favorite hobbies are playing video games, um, riding my bike, riding my scooter. Um, I also really love dinosaurs. Here's some, a, a fact of some dinosaurs. Did you know that the Allosaurus does, doesn't have serrated teeth? And it actually uses jaw. He, he opens his mouth and he slashes his upper jaw into its prey like a hammer. We are making donut chocolate donut cakes. So we have this flour, so we're gonna dump it into the sieve. <laughs> I wanna be a pastry chef because I'm already a pastry chef. I am so excited because today we are making eggless trini macaroni and pie and blender muffins with apples, bananas, and carrots. First we're 
we're gonna start with the macaroni pie. Here's everything we need to start with. We got butter, we got olive oil, cut up onions, onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper, flour, mustard, cheese, salt, but we also need elbow and pasta and milk. First, we're gonna make the cheese sauce. First, we're gonna melt the, the butter the, and the olive oil over medium heat. Now the next step, we need to add the onions. Make sure you cook it for a few minutes because we don't want the smell of the onions to make us cry. The next step, you need to add the flour and you need to make a roux. A roux is fat mixed with flour. You need to um, whisk it so it doesn't give that raw flour taste. That would taste horrible. This is what's gonna thicken the sauce since I'm not using egg. Now we need to add the milk to the pot, but make sure to add it slowly because we don't want it to spot all over the place. Now we need to whisk it until it's fully incorporated. Next, we're gonna add the mustard. Now we're ready to put in the spices. We got our onion powder, the garlic powder in, and the black pepper in. And the salt, let's put in the salt too. Bubbling, it looks like lava. This is what we're looking for. I wish you guys can smell this. Cause that really smells good. Now for the best part, we put in the cheese. Now we're going back to mixing. The sauce looks like this. This is a little hot, so you know who I need? Mommy! Almost there, up. It's important to incorporate the pasta into the cheese sauce. We're gonna put in a greased baking dish and then we're gonna top it off with cheese. This looks great. Now we're just gonna add some cheese to on the top. I need to pop this in the oven, so I need to call mom again. Mom! Oh, it looks good. Okay, I'm gonna open the oven. Okay. Thanks, mom. Oh no, thank you. Good job. We're gonna let it bake for 25 or 30 minutes. This looks awesome. It wouldn't be complete without my favorite person. Mmm. Mm. Yeah. We come from a long line of foodies in our family, a long line of cooks, and you're just carrying on that tradition by continuing to be one of the chefs in our family. <laughs> mm. 
controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast. Free wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Now we're going to make one of my favorite recipes, blender muffins without egg. They have apples, carrots, and bananas. But to help me, I'm going to have my sister, Natalie. Come on. Bling. So we're going to make, introduce yourself, Natalie. Okay, so my name is Natalie, and I'm going in kindergarten soon. And my, my favorite food is fruits and vegetables. Five, I'm five, and I'm Alexander's sister. And my nickname and, is Peanut. And her nickname's Peanut, but she has a peanut allergy. But this also has um, no eggs, so it's Isn't that safe funny, guys? Now we have this big mixing bowl, so now we're gonna put in all our dry ingredients. Let's start with the flour. Sugar. Oh, plop. Oh, is this some? Ah, oh, there you go. Put it back. Now we put in white sugar. Now we put in baking powder. And my turn. Put in baking soda. Now let's put in some cinnamon, like for cinnamon rolls. Let's mix. Let's make finger muffins. Mix, mix. Mix, mix up, <laughs> agitate around. Okay, okay. Your turn. Now we need the blender, and now we're going to ask Mom for the blender. Mom! <laughs> now we're going to add the, the apples, the carrots, and bananas to the blender. Let's start with the apples. Yeah! Blop, blop. It's time for carrot time. We're going to put in the carrots. Ah. And guys, in case you know, these are for our bunnies, but we use them for baking now. Let's put the banana peel in. Break it in half and then put the other half in. That might be smart. <laughs> it looks weird. I wonder. Look, I'm, trying, I'm trying to get the ones in the on the back. Maybe we should do it together. Let's mix and agitate, agitate, agitate. Let's mix and agitate. Let's do that. Mm -mm -mm. Now let's add. I'll add the butter. Vanilla and. Let's do it. Three, two, one. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'll do the chocolate chips. No, I want to. No. Fine. Let's, do, let's pour it at the same time, Anza. Three, two, one. Whee! Wait, the oats. Ooh, this looks good. Mm. Now we have our muffin tin. Yep. We get to spray our muffin tin. Yeah, we need to do it three quarter way full. How about you scoop it and I put it in? These 
these are ready to go in the oven now. And now let's get mom. Now it's going to take 18 to 22 minutes. Bye, we'll see you on the next day. I just want to gobble them all up in my mouth. These have been cooling for 10 minutes, so they're ready to eat. makes the yummy drink. Here he is, the amazing Ben Platt. He is here. He's got a new album. It's out today. It's called Reverie. Ah, today is the day, and Ben's going to treat us to some incredible performances throughout the morning. But before he does, the man of the hour, Ben, good morning. I know it's early there. How you doing? Good morning. I'm doing good. Nothing better to wake up for than you guys. Oh. Well, you're so sweet. And we've been talking about this all morning. It, you moved home during the pandemic and you were in your childhood bedroom. I was thinking most of us would just be looking at old yearbooks, you know, maybe do some <laughs> light stalking of what happened to those old high school friends we used to hang out with. Not you. You wrote a whole album. Tell me about it. Well, I did spend some time looking at old yearbooks, and I was voted <laughs> most, likely to be, uh, most likely to be on Broadway, so it was pretty accurate. Ooh. But um, yeah. I, I, I was super inspired by just like the nostalgia of being back in that space and seeing all of my posters everywhere and you know my clothes I used to wear and just the feeling like you know whenever you're home, you kind of revert to your teenage self. And so <laughs> the kind of juxtaposition of that looking backwards feeling with the kind of looking forwards feeling and feeling a little more evolved and adult and slightly more mature. I think that the album came kind of like right between. I think that's why I got inspired was feeling kind of young and old at the same time. Mm. Yeah, been one of the things that we enjoy about having you at the show is is we've been able to see up close your career evolve from you know, obviously Dear Evan Hansen, Pitch Perfect, and now you're you know you're a legit recording artist who turns out like hit after hit. What, what's it like for you right now, this particular moment in your career? I just feel incredibly fortunate. I, I feel really lucky that there are people that want to hear my perspective and hear my music. You know, I, I feel privileged already to be an actor and get to spend a lot of time transforming into other people and telling other people's stories. And I grew up in the theater, you know, focusing on that. And so now to have this outlet where I can bring my own emotional life to the forefront and really focus on what's my story and, you know, what's my vernacular and what a, what does my music sound like and have people really respond to that is, it's very lucky not so many people get to do that. So I'm just really trying to take it in day by day. And I think people are gonna really find a lot of joy in this, in this album, hopefully. Hey Ben, so on this album, you've got some really lovely uh, songs, romantic songs. Uh, love songs. What was what was the inspiration for those? Um, it's no secret that the inspiration for a lot of the songs in the album is my partner Noah Galvin, um, who I've been with for the last couple of years. Oh, there we are. Oh. <laughs> uh, he is just the most wonderful person. I can't say enough about him. We were friends for many years. 
um, sort of dallied a little bit with being together over the years. And I was pretty stupid about it and didn't really see the light until uh, the end of 2019 when I finally clicked in and realized how special he was. And we've been together ever since. So, yeah, a lot of it is about kind of finally finding that person. I love that. And Ben, you're also here with a very special announcement. What do you have going on? Um, well, I get to go on tour uh, from February to April of next year. Hey, hey. And play yes. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to perform live again, finally. It's my favorite thing to do in the world. I'm going all over the country. I'll be all up and down the East Coast, through the middle, on the West Coast. I get to play the Hollywood Bowl, uh, mm. Madison Square Garden, the Santa Barbara Bowl. I'm, I'm just, I couldn't be more thrilled and excited. And I get to bring the amazing Jake Wesley Rogers with me. He's going to open for me, who is very talented, awesome. one of Elton John's protégés. Um, and yeah. it's, uh, it's so exciting. Well, you're a rock star, Ben. You're legit. <laughs> Our friend Sarah Varellis is live with us on the plaza. Sarah is back on Broadway. We love hearing that. She's starring as Jenna, of course, in her Tony-nominated musical, Waitress. Waitress, one of the longest-running shows in recent Broadway history, and it's back for a limited engagement starting September 2nd. Sarah, it is so Good great morning. to have you. Morning. I want to thank you officially for putting me next to Olympic athletes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I've never felt But if you're talking about people at the top of their craft, you're at the top That's of their right. craft. If there was an Olympic, exactly. an, Olympic, an Olympic medal for, for performing, you yes. would have it, especially on this show because you've been with us for so long. <laughs> but th this is so terrific. It's got to be a bit of an honor that now that Broadway is coming back, and there are so many shows that could have been chosen to come back, but you guys are one of the first. What does that feel like? Oh, I mean, it's a tremendous honor. It was it, when we got the opportunity to be a part of sort of like the welcoming committee mm. of, of Broadway shows, inviting people to come back into the theater, putting people back to work, and trying to do it in a, in a new way, more intentionally, and of course safely for everybody. It's it's just, you know, it's a, it's a joy. The show is the, it's the love of my life, so that's why they can't kick me out. <laughs> They're like, how many times are you gonna do the show? Oh, people, right. people love it. I've seen it four times. Like, I've literally, yeah. been, it's insane. Um, so there's this great video I wanna show people at home of the cast. Um, they're rehearsing one of the first numbers of the show, opening up. Uh, what did it feel like to be back with that group of people? You're playing Jenna again. You guys are all together again. What was that like? It was so surreal. I mean, you see us. This is literally the first time we sang the song Aww. together, and we're all back. And so many people, this is of our cast, are, are you know returning members. This is a real family for us. So to get to be back in the room together was truly magical yeah. it was magical and speaking of family i know waitress was, was hit especially hard through the pandemic losing beloved castmate uh, nick cordero yeah. to covid yeah. i mean what what does it mean not only to be one of the shows back but to have the whole cast kind of i mean go out there and do it for him yeah it was you know one of the first things we discussed when we were all back in the room together and um we're talking about different ways we want to honor him you know through the life of the show um, and working with his wife, Amanda, mm -hmm. and just, he, you know, Broadway lost a really bright light and, yeah. and our waitress family will never be the same. But, you know, we got to know him and to love him and that's such a gift mm -hmm. and reminds us all how short life precious. is and how precious, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And, and one of the joys of getting through the pandemic was was Girls Five Ever. Five Ever. Uh, yeah, it's already been picked up for season two. Uh, tell me about you know performing in, in an ensemble like this, and even getting to write some music for it. I mean, if I would, if you told me this was coming, you know, <laughs> down the pipeline for me, I would not have believed you. To get the phone call from Tina Fey and be like. Do you want to join these extraordinary people awesome. and make this hilarious show with Meredith Scardino, our creator showrunner, oh Paula Bell, Busy Phillips, Renee Lee Goldsberry? I mean, it's just a, a gift. I, I never saw it coming. It's been so much fun. I laughed every day, <laughs> and it was. And we we worked on the show in the in the heat of the pandemic, so we were all so grateful to be with people that we didn't live with mm. every day. <laughs> No, and it was so well received. It. That's the thing. You know what I mean? We longed for it. So before you leave, we can't let you go without talking about Pie. Hi. One of my favorite parts of the show. I feel like it's a character in Waitress. It, no question about it, really. It really, really is. Really? Okay, so this pie is a chocolate mousse with strawberries. Mm, what would that symbolize for Jenna? Oh, this is decadence. This is um, this is sensuality. Mm. This is her sort of discovering 
pleasure. Ooh. Let's put it that way. Let me tell I you. I want to give a shout out to Stacey Can Donnelly. You? I was just about to say, who does these? Stacey the Donnelly. She is our pie genius. They're so and, I mean, good. They guys. are really. I hear it. And look, we've got little you. mini Sister ones. You can eat them out of a jar. This yes. one's probably, you want chocolate? Or yes, you want, yes, I want okay, chocolate. Okay. Give the pregnant lady the whole pie. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, when you go to the show, you get, you get these little buy pies. Buy. And they're so good. I, every time I say, okay, I'm going to save oh, it wow. at least for the first act. Yeah. And it's always gone before you guys even start. No, and, it's, and you can use these again and again. Yeah. <laughs> and the, the great part is when can you go corn, in, please? they start baking a pie. Oh, my gosh. So that it. You, you smell pie oh, in the that's theater. that's how they get that smell. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's a real pie. And Al knows he was one of our beloved cast members as playing old Joe, the, mm -hmm. the diner owner. And I was just saying before the camera started rolling how beloved you were in our in our cast. So, it, it, you still so sing wonderful. It? Uh, I, I, no, not probably. Yes, probably. you could. But, <laughs> but what I will say is that you guys, the cast couldn't have been more welcoming because I was worried. It's like, who's this jerk coming in? You know. He's and, Al Roker. And, He's and, Al Roker. No, there we go. Uh, that's right there. Look at you. Yes. It was so wonderful. Yeah. And I got to do it with Jordan Sparks and. What a what a terrific time! Thank you so much, and thank you for bringing this thing back because it's such it's so much joy. It's what it is. Need. That's yeah. a good way to put it. Yeah, it it's really for having us. And there's pie. Uh, yeah. By the way, catch up on I'm Girls like, Five Ever streaming on Peacock. <laughs> uh, Waitress opens up on uh, September second. So much, so much goodness. Thank you thank so you. much. I love Sarah. it. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the Round Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get you in. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from the Round Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been proud. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. You are some resilient folks. Let me get you in. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. If you follow Grammy winner Megan Trainer on social media, you already know that being a new mom is a dream come true. And you got the chance to catch up with the whole family. I did. So a long time ago, when I first met Megan, she told me one thing. She said, I want a big family. Well, this morning, in an exclusive interview from her new home, Megan is talking about life these days with her husband, actor Daryl, and their beautiful baby boy, Riley, by her side. With four studio albums and strings of pop singles, 27-year-old Megan Trainer launched to superstardom seven years ago with her breakthrough smash single, All About That Bass, selling 11 million copies worldwide. Hi, you can do it. But these days, the Grammy winner is all about that baby. Oh my God, Megan, can you believe, how does it feel to have this little one? I think I was like 20 years old when I told Hoda, I was like, I'm gonna have babies, just you wait. <laughs> That's why you're the first person I had to tell. Hearing her announce her pregnancy news, her dream come true was pure magic. We're pregnant! Oh my gosh. Now, for the first time, the Grammy winner, her husband, Daryl, along with their precious five-and-a-half-month-old, Riley, are opening up about parenthood and who the baby looks like. Okay, I'm sorry, but it looks like you are holding your husband in the dryer. <laughs> 
Yeah, he's... I think he's like a perfect blend between... He's a good blend. Daryl, you holding that little boy is so perfect. Did it come naturally to you? I think so. Oh, yeah. I'm having a blast. Baby Riley is happy and healthy, but Megan says he had a rocky and scary start. People talk about the moment that you're, the baby gets put on your chest, and you had to wait a little bit. Yeah, no, he, he got taken, like, right away to the NICU. I was like, where's the cry? Because no one said anything. I was like, he's not where's crying. Cry? Yeah. So they said he was full of liquid still, and that C-sections, this can happen. They took him away, and Daryl begged for them to let me see him for one second before they took him. Riley was whisked away to the neonatal intensive care unit where he required a feeding tube. We were like, what's the update? And they said, it's just up to Riley when he wants to like wake up for reals. Yeah. So we just waited like four or five days. Yeah. yeah. And then he's like, let's rock. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Riley. And the proud parents have documented every step of the way, including heartwarming moments like this one. I love you. I love you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I saw the video and I am telling you that baby said, he said I, I love, you. love you. No question. He's never said it again, but that was it. <laughs> I'm Megan Trainer. Three months after giving birth, the singer-songwriter went back to work. I don't know if I was fully ready, but we did it. Daryl's up with him and he lets me sleep until like eight. He made it almost easy. <laughs> was that what happened? Did he just let one go? I don't I know. He's thinking about it. We got the diapers that tell us if he's peed or not. You're good. I've never changed a, a boy diaper, so I understand that that takes some finesse and some skills. Yes, I thought I had it down, but literally yesterday he peed on my countertop, and I was like, what are you doing? Sometimes people can be judgy just because you always said your piece. You were like, nope, faucets off. Breastfeeding, like that's oh, that yeah. about that. I did a lot of research before of like, why is breastfeeding so hard? Especially with a C-section, my body wasn't like, all right, time to make milk. So I was pumping as soon as I got to my room after the C-section and nothing was happening. I really struggled making milk. Finally, I was like, I'm done. <laughs> I did so well, look at me. Everyone was like, good for you. I'm proud that you even tried. What do you sing to little Riley? We're changing your diaper, yeah. you know? <laughs> like, everything's a song. Does Riley know when your music's on? Can he tell? I've seen him one time when I'm singing really soft, he'll start to tear up like those babies on TikTok and the internet. Wait, what? Yeah, have you ever seen those babies where yes. like they'll hear their mom sing and they're just like, and I was like, he hears me. And Megan says it's the unexpected simple moments that are some of the most meaningful. If I walk in a room, he just lights up. He's like, the biggest smile. No one told me he's going to love you so much and light up when you walk in a room. You're like, oh my goodness, <laughs> worth everything. I can't tell you how thrilled I am for you guys. It's just fun to watch y'all develop into Be amazing parents. parents. <laughs> <laughs> ah, Kleenexes. Aisle two. I love you guys. Oh, I love you. Thank I you. Bye. you every day. Bye, Riley. Oh. The sweetest, the sweetest. Yeah. And y'all, she's so close to her family, her mom, her dad, and her brothers. Her brothers actually moved into the house with her, so she has <laughs> built-in babysitters. Yeah. She's always kept that family <clears throat> unit. She's always kept it real. the most of your day with today in 30 we give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes <laughs> savannah and hoda bring you what you must know the biggest moments of the morning one republic exclusive interviews why did it work for you you're right i am more talented than the rest <laughs> and important headlines major medical news this morning watch today in 30 on your schedule streaming every day on today all day to cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. 
We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Let's catch up with two of the members of Duran Duran joining us live with probably a little bit of a delay, so forgive us. From London, we've got Simon LeBond and Roger Taylor. Guys, good morning. I'll jump right in. Right. 2021 marks 40 years since Duran Duran's become a global phenomenon. And just as you guys look back at the 40 years, what would you say would be the secret to your success? Probably not looking back. Mm. Ah, uh, excellent, Roger. I think I, I think, think we do. You know, we do. We try to keep looking forward. I mean, we've got such a history, and so much behind us, and so many years that we we do actually. I think generally, you know, try and keep in the moment, keep looking yeah. forward, and and try <clears throat> to keep moving on. Really, we're good mates, and I think that goes a long way to keeping us together as a band. You know, we spend time together and laugh a lot. Yes, definitely. On that, what's it like to have young Finn now whose parents uh, were fans 30, 40 years ago? What did you say? Did you catch that? I didn't catch that. What's it like now because you have a whole new generation of fans? Ah, um, it's amazing. I mean, you, you sort of, we, we didn't know what was going to happen. You know, we didn't know. We, we, when we started this band, we didn't see further than six months in the future. Wow. And now, 40 years ahead, we've got fans of lots of different generations. And it's extraordinary. I think we, we all feel very, very, very fortunate. I mean, you, you've had such a storied career. Uh, is, is there a single achievement of which you are proudest over the last 40 years? I think sticking together, actually, um, the second time around. You know, we did have a little bit of a split, but when we got back together in 2001, we stayed together, and I think that is a real achievement. Simon, as I understand it, you went into the studio in late 2018. Uh, after you'd put out Paper Gods, you maybe could have recorded two or three songs and released an EP, yeah. but here we are now, a couple years after that, with a full track list that is future past. Where yeah. did COVID play a role in that? Well, COVID came in, as you know, as you know, about a year and a couple of months after we started the project. And it really stopped everything. You know, our producer sent us an email saying, I'm not coming to the studio anymore. And, um, and that really stopped everything in its tracks. And we were trying to get the album out in um, 2020. But 2020 was a complete was it got written off really. But in that year, in between when when everything closed down and which also included us coming back to work and and re getting the project started again, we all had a chance to yeah. step back and and really in the same way as an artist would with a picture, and um, and we stepped back and we saw where the weaknesses were and where the strengths were, and we were able to yeah. able to make it a much better album for that. It's very cool. Got a lot of collaborations on. I see got Graham from Blurs yeah. playing guitar. I think Licky Lee's got some vocals on it. It's, it's just a really yeah. cool album. You have three great producers, but specifically Simon or John, tell me about working with Mark Ronson because we here in the States know so much of uh, his successful tracks. Yeah, um, I mean, we worked with uh, Mark for many years and we love to work with Mark. I mean, he's such an inspirational guy to work with. So it was great to work with Mark here yeah. on this record. It was a great collaboration. Uh, but I think generally we, we feel as though we're at such a, a great moment by now because we, as Simon was saying, we've been locked away for so long with the lockdown and everything. And, it, you know, we've just finished the album as we, we seem to be coming out of this whole thing. And it just seems such a, a beautiful moment. Yeah.
Yeah. By the way, this is Roger, not yes, John. Yes, not John. I'm the other Taylor. <laughs> yes. Right. So, right. Right. Gotcha. Sorry about that. It, How yeah, do you think your them. music is different from you know, from back in the days of, of MTV? I know that Nick's talked a lot about your sort of sonic landscape and the importance of Duran Duran's music, its relationship with technology, which you see in the Invisible video. How do you think that your music's evolved? Um, I mean, it's evolved as music has evolved. You know, we we've always tr gone into the studio with with an experimental mindset. We've always wanted to discover new music for the band, but at the same time, there is a sound that is always Duran Duran. It's got a lot to do with the way I sing. It's got a lot to do with the way Roger plays the drums and John plays the bass guitar, the kind of sounds that Nick makes on his keyboard. Um, but, we, but we're always listening to mu new music as well. And I think we're very affected by the great progress and developments that are happening um, in the art form um, while, while we're doing our thing, the, the stuff that other artists are doing. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. But when the school board presented its plan, it ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative. Shame. This is Southlake. All episodes available now. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Watch Today in 30 on your schedule, streaming every day on Today All Day. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's principal of the year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hint. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We are talking about Tesher and Jason Derulo's Jalebi Baby. It already has nearly 200 million global streams, and it's one of the year's biggest songs on TikTok. They're going to treat us to an exclusive performance here in just a minute, but first, let's catch up with them. Tesher, Jason, good to see you both. Good morning. How are you guys doing today? Good, good. Doing very good morning, well. Guys. Good to see you all. Good to see you, too. Tesher, let me start with you. And by the way, congrats, man. You're absolutely blowing up right now. But for those who are watching the Today Show this morning, explain what Talebi Baby means. <laughs> so it's Jalebi Baby. Uh, a jalebi is actually a South Asian sweet, most commonly found in like India, Pakistan, that region. And it's just like a syrup based uh, sweet. To be honest, actually, I think I can just demonstrate right oh, here. This oh, is a jalebi. a jalebi. I came prepared. <laughs> I came prepared. But uh, it's a very syrupy and sweet dessert, commonly Yum. found at celebrations, Indian weddings. And I loved it so much, I made a song about it. Oh, there you go. <laughs> well, not, not to be outdone here, Tesher, uh, we actually have some jalebis oh, here look at this. in oh, the wow. studio. So we wanted to, to get in on the I'm going to try jalebi. Wait, so how would you describe time. what this tastes like? Because it looks like. Look, on TV, it looked like a churro. It did. But it, it's not. It's... Oh. Okay. Oh, that's, oh, that's try good. it. I like that. They're, they're very sweet. Uh, Jason actually got the chance mm. to make some. So. Wow. That's good. <laughs> Jason Derulo, man of big talents. And, Mm. I did, man. And I, honestly, I got to say, I'm a little jealous. You know, it's early, bright and early in the morning. Y'all eating jalebis and I got nothing. Uh -huh. <laughs> For people at home, we I didn't, you, I didn't expect you. it to taste like this. It tastes like a funnel cake. Yes. Like dipped in sugar. Dipped in sugar. Sweet. So very sweet and delicious. By the way, Jason, I follow you on social. You had a busy year. I waited along mm -hmm. for the gender reveal with the rest of the world to see what you were having. And now I can say, obviously, you have a baby boy. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. How's it been? <laughs> You know, it's it's actually it's it's incredible. Um, yep. Uh oh. Oh no. I we lost his audio for a second. Let's try to get it back, Tesher. While we try to get Jason's audio back, mm -hmm. this is the first time you guys have collaborated. How, how did the how did the collab come about? 
um, very organically, actually. Basically, so my song was just blowing up all over TikTok and the internet, and um, it kind of caught the ear of Jason Derulo, which was kind of crazy because I was in a place where I was thinking, how can I help take my song to the next level? And Jason was one of the guys that I actually had in mind to bring it to that next level because he makes high energy records. He knows uh, how songs can transcend through yeah. the internet into the mainstream, into the actual, uh, into the world, you know, and be played on the radio. So he actually uh, came to me and said, you know, this song, it's caught my ear. I really like it. And he believed in the record enough to lend his voice to it and be a part of it and take it to the next level, which you will see we did. I love it. There's so many artists, Tesher, who, you know, who are hoping that that scenario happens to them because access to success in mainstream, you know, through Jason Derulo discovering your song, through utilizing his 50 million social impressions and TikTok. I mean, this is such a great moment for you. How do you capitalize on it? What do you plan to do kind of in the next six months? Man, I'm just so happy that this is happening. Like you said, a lot of artists dream for this opportunity. And so above all, I'm just humbled and thankful to have the opportunity, especially for a song that's so rooted in South Asian identity. It's very rare that we have a song that's not even entirely in English. It's actually in Punjabi. Right. Uh, and that gets to transcend to the mainstream. That has yeah. not happened in a long, long time. So for me, you know, I'm happy that this is a great moment for the culture. Uh, but also, I just want to take this opportunity and run with it, man. I just want to keep making more music, keep entertaining people, and above all, just keep sharing my art with, uh, with the world. Good for you. Yeah, good Great. for you, man. Yeah, equal yeah. parts humble and smart. Mm -hmm. Hello and welcome to Consumer Confidential on Today All Day. I'm NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn. This week we're looking at some home safety with tips and tricks for easy appliance repairs, cleaning a fireplace, and the importance of having a working carbon monoxide detector. Plus, what you need to know before renting a home share. All that and more coming up on Today All Day. A private island in Indonesia? You can rent it on Airbnb. Or how about this Irish castle, listed here on Verbo? In the month of September alone, there were nearly five million homes rented on just those two sites. Even Marriott, the largest hotel chain, can't ignore the trend, now offering select homes and villas for rent. One of the biggest perks of using a home share, the ability to rent something you might not otherwise get to experience. Take, for example, this beautiful home here on Nantucket Island in Massachusetts. We're in a six bedroom home. It rents for $25,000 a week, but hang on, it sleeps 14 people. So if you do the math, that actually works out to $255 per night per person, a similar price to what you pay for a comparable hotel, but you get all of this shared space in an exclusive location. And with a kitchen, you have the option to cook meals over multiple days for a big group. Those savings add up. Jeremy Gall is the CEO of Breezeway, a company that helps property managers maintain quality and safety standards for vacation rentals. What's the advantage of using a home share? Two big things. There's so much space and the property is so unique. So you get to really enjoy something that's different than when you stay in a hotel. But that difference also means you should have a safety checklist when renting a home share. When you first get to a home, what should you be looking for? Yeah, you're gonna walk in, you're gonna wanna unpack, everybody's excited, but the first thing you should do is just orientate yourself and get aware about the property. Here's a good example. Here's where the fire extinguisher is and emergency numbers and contact information. And what about those chemicals under the sink? Don't expect there's gonna be safety latches on these properties. Uh, but if you're traveling with little kids, just be aware and make sure these are all taken care of. Maybe move, take the time to move them up. In a home, pay particular attention to the smoke detector outside the kitchen. Prior guests might have cooked something smoky and pulled the batteries. When renting an entire home, consider the unfamiliar features, especially at night. The number one accident at vacation homes is trip and fall hazards. This property has a nightlight, but it's always a good idea to bring one with you. I love this room. I see it has a bunk bed. A lot of home shares have bunk beds. What are the safety tips around bunk beds? Popular option, kids under six shouldn't be in the top bunk. 
So this is something a lot of people might not have in their own home, a huge balcony like this with this kind of view. Yeah, amazing. If you have a balcony like this, you want to look at three things, the height, the stability, and the gaps in between the balusters to make sure it's not too wide. Yeah, good idea if you have kids and also pets. Yeah, pets is a really good point. Pools can be fun, but a lot of times the pools don't have any kind of fencing around them. No, this is wide open and there's really easy access. So a couple things to keep in mind. One, if you're traveling in a group, designate one adult who's gonna be in charge of pool safety. Okay. The other thing to do is check with the manager, make sure you understand how the pool cover works so you can open and close it and keep it closed when you're not using it. Some simple tips so you can safely enjoy your time in a home away from home. So it's just something to be aware of. Like I said, some people love it, some people don't. We use it a lot, mm -hmm. just frankly, Same. because then we have a whole house, we have a kitchen, I don't have to worry about somebody coming in. Anyway, but you, there are some horror stories that people say where they feel like they've been watched or videos. So what do we need to know to protect ourselves? Yeah, that's a big one. Spy cams can yes. be an issue. It's been in the headlines. Think about it. They are so easy to hide. This right here is a spy cam. Wait, that's right the tissue there box? in wow. this tissue box. Yeah, there you go. And oh, I'm that's actually, creepy. I can watch you live in real is time. Is it someone else's eye? It's someone else's eye. Wow. Yeah. Oh, oh. There you Let are. it go. Let it go. That is. <laughs> Let it go. <laughs> it's creepy, but it's kind of cool. It is super cool. Wait, that right? is crazy. I mean, not for you know, you know what I mean. But like if you're looking at, you know. What else? Are those cameras? Technologically, it's cool. Yes, Dylan. That is a smoke detector, an alarm clock. Those are both cameras. So these things are getting sneakier and sneakier, easier to hide. Is it a camera? Yeah. But is it for the homeowner to make sure their house isn't being used in a way? That's true. Like, you know, if it's just big parties for, you know, underage kids? If or? that's the case, then you have to disclose it. Most mm -hmm. of these rental sites make you say, hey, there's a camera in the front right. door. There's a camera in the living room. They shouldn't be in the bathroom, the bedroom. And that's why you need to check for things that are suspicious, like something plugged in an outlet in a mm -hmm. bathroom or smoke detector over the toilet or the mm -hmm. shower. Oh, well, What's now, it doing well, there? Yeah, that's, hey, now. that's a problem. Right? <laughs> what if you get there and, you know, you saw this, these great pictures on the website, then you get get there and it's like, this looks nothing like mm -hmm. what I, I pay, paid for. Big problem. First thing, call the person that you're renting from, try to negotiate that refund. If not, bypass them, head straight to the website. But really the most important thing, be proactive about it. Check to see if there's reviews. If there aren't very many, that's a red flag. Do a Google Street View, enter the address. That's if oh. the exterior doesn't yeah. match what you're seeing in real time, mm -hmm. that's a big red flag. Vicky Wynn, you always make us a little smarter. And I, you, when you said the Street View <laughs> thing, I've been doing that from now on. It's a really yeah. good tip. And yeah. Craig wants to know, can you have the uh, Elsa box? <laughs> <laughs> This is next that's level. Cool. It's all yours, Craig. Look How much eyes. does something like this cost? Oh, what is <laughs> I am, I'm, I'm gonna get in. I'll check in on that and get back to okay. you. We'll we can get right a little back. custom. Maybe we'll do a minions cool. one for Ooh, you. Craig. Craig's got a pants can. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back hopefully. Welcome back to the third hour today. Actress and comedian Anna Faris had quite the scare last week. Mm -hmm. During what was supposed to be a fun family Thanksgiving at a rental home, it quickly turned into a potentially deadly situation. Uh, she writes on Twitter, I'm not quite sure how to express gratitude to the North Lake Tahoe Fire Department. We were saved from carbon monoxide. It's a stupidly dramatic story, but I'm feeling very fortunate. What happened? Well, so, first of all, we have Vicki. That's right. Our investigate NBC News investigative and consumer correspondent Vicki Wynn to talk morning. more about this. Good, Vicky. Good morning. Yeah, this is a scary one, especially this time of year. We're inside more. The windows are closed. And this really could happen to anyone at your home or even when you're on vacation. So that's when you're vulnerable. What happened? So essentially, people in her group started to feel sick. A couple of them actually went to the hospital. They thought, oh, we're in Lake Tahoe. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not used to the altitude. Turns out they were suffering from carbon monoxide poisoning. The emergency responders went back to the house, treated two more people at this Lake Tahoe rental. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, you saw the picture on Twitter, but maybe was sealed, didn't have a carbon monoxide alarm. Hmm. Firefighters haven't said what the source of the carbon monoxide gas was, but they did say it was CO poisoning. Hmm. And had they all just said, oh, you know what, we're gonna sleep this off, hmm. that could have been a deadly why situation. Why didn't they s just sleep it off? Why did, why did their symptoms, get, or how did their symptoms get bad enough that they decided they needed to call for help? Well, the symptoms are headache, dizziness, um, nausea, so they felt so mm, bad, they scary, felt like they yeah. had to go to the hospital, which hmm. is good that they didn't lie down and just say, oh, it's yeah. nothing, I'll just so get over it. would just lie down. A lot of people and, would, and yeah, absolutely. the results could have been a lot different. In fact, Anna's dad, Jack, in the North Tahoe Fire Public Information had a lot to say about the scare. Mm. Take a look. We are grateful to be alive. We thought we just had um, the effects of being at high altitude, and it turned out that that was not the case. 
had they just gone to sleep and hoped that they felt better in the morning, none of them would have woken up. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That yeah. is so scary. Strong what words are, what are some true. Folks, folks who are watching or listening, some things that they can do to make sure that this is not something that happens to them. Mm. Really important to just check on any gas powered uh, appliances in your house, mm -hmm. whether that's your gas stove or your range. You don't want Generators. to be using your generator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You don't want to be using those without proper ventilation. This is another thing people do this time of year. You want to get in your car, warm it up before you head out. It's winter. Get that garage door open. Mm -hmm. Carbon monoxide gas builds up mm -hmm. so quickly. And Dylan, I think you were talking about apartments, right? Like can right, you still I, I feel like a lot I'm of people not live sure in an if apartment. I have one, but I live in an apartment. I don't have a, a car connected to the, the house or anything. So is it a threat for people who live in an apartment too? It can be. Sometimes people use those space heaters to warm up oh, a small yeah. sure. space. If that is a gas-fueled um, right. space heater, yeah. then that can be an issue. Mm. Basically, carbon monoxide is produced anytime you burn a fuel. And this is the number one thing, right? Yes, the carbon monoxide alarm. Mm. You can get this for under $30, $20, really, at any big box retailer. Mm -hmm. We picked one up at Dwayne Reed. Fire departments this time of year are also giving these things away free. So check with your yeah. local fire department if it's not something you can buy. And by the way, there is a... a a, 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 an expiration on these mm -hmm. generally five years is the is the efficacy of it and then you have to replace them that's a really good point Alan also check the batteries yeah. twice a year daylight savings that's a good time to go for the smoke alarms and the carbon monoxide thank alarms. you Will. thank yeah, you thank so you. much thank you. I'm glad we talked about this and we'll yeah. be right back today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, the taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get you in. Hey everybody, it's Hoda Kotb from The Today Show. I am so, so excited to tell you about my new podcast, Making Space with Hoda Kotb. I sit down with some incredible people and we'll hear some uplifting stories. Listen to Making Space now on Apple Podcasts. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Okay, so get ready to take notes. Lifestyle expert Jill Bauer has a list of must-haves to make sure you and your family are prepared in an unexpected emergency. Good morning, Jill. Good morning, ladies. Nice to see you. Ooh, okay, you're going to show us what we need in our home and in our cars, right? Right, because you know, this is the time of year when people are making resolutions and they're thinking about ways to get organized. Well, part of that should be, is my family prepared in case something should happen? So let's take a look at what you need the next time you're out on the road. So here are the things that are important to keep in the front area of your car. In your center console, you wanna make sure you have a tool like this. This is designed to cut through your seat belt in case you can't unbuckle, as well as break through glass if you're trapped. And then in your glove box, a couple other things you should have on hand. Make sure that you have a small first aid kit. Make sure you have an additional phone charger with a cable and make sure that that's charged. And also make sure you have a small hand crank flashlight. You also need to have some key things in the back of your car, so let me show you what those are. I like to keep the back of my car organized with a duffel bag like this one and here are the essentials I always have on hand. Start out with my jumper cables, an extra blanket, a comprehensive first aid kit, a couple of different kinds of lights are important. So an all-weather flashlight, make sure that you've checked those batteries, but also an emergency light like this that lets other cars see you in the dark. Those are great because they're magnetic. These emergency thermal blankets and rain ponchos, you can usually find those at outdoor stores. They don't take up a lot of room, but they're really great in case you need them. A pair of gloves, some duct tape, and then don't forget about some extra snacks and a bottle of water. And if you happen to travel with your pets, make sure you include some dog treats too. 
Oh. Jill, love it. you know it all. That was awesome information. Now you've taken us inside the home where you're going to get to everything we need, starting with fire safety. Yeah. And this is so important, everybody, because I know you probably have on your radar, let's make sure we check our batteries and our smoke detectors. But here's what a lot of people don't know. The detector themselves, the unit, only has a 10-year shelf life. Oh. So if you've lived in the same house for 15 years and all you're doing is continually charging the batteries, you could still have a faulty unit. So make sure you're charging or you're replacing the unit every 10 years and the batteries regularly. Same with carbon monoxide detectors. Those should be located on all levels of your home. And then in case you should need to put out a small fire, make sure you have fire extinguishers. They have fire extinguishers now for specific areas of the home. So that also makes them a little bit lighter and easier to manage, especially one you might want to keep under the sink in your kitchen. I like to write the date on those extinguishers so that you know when you put it in. Most of these have a kind of shelf life of six to 12 years. And finally, if you live on a or live in a home that's multi-level, you want to make sure that you do have a fire escape ladder. That fire escape ladder is something you should practice with, not going out and climbing down it, but making sure that it fits the window properly so that in the event you would need to use it, you know that it's gonna work the way that it should. By the way, the smoke detector, carbon monoxide, and fire extinguishers are also great for people who live in apartments or condos, not just homeowners. Mm -hmm. All right, so if we're moving now, let's move to, by the way, I'm like taking notes on all these things, a ladder, who would have thought? All right, so <laughs> when a storm hits, often you lose electricity and you feel like, uh oh, what am I gonna do? Most of us have a flashlight. What else should you have? So these are basics, Hoda. You know, have a stockpile of extra batteries. Make sure you have some different types of lanterns and lamps. I like flameless candles. But check out this cool new innovative flashlight from GE. This is a regular flashlight that you're, or excuse flashlight. me, light bulb that you're going to put inside of your lamp. And you're going to use it like you use normal light bulbs. However, when the power goes out, it stays on. What? And you can even unscrew it from your lamp turn it on and use it as a handheld flashlight that gets a five hour charge they're led bulbs so they last for hundreds of hours of light it's a really cool concept and i think it's a great peace of mind yeah that really is i feel like we should all have at least one of those let's talk about drinking water if it becomes compromised yeah, so you can, you know, for kind of personal emergency things, you want to make sure that you have an all-weather radio, have a whistle so that you can let people know where you are, have a backup supply of drinking water, but then use something called a life straw. Again, these are things that you'll find at a lot of outdoor um, kind of adventure places. They need them for survival. They're great survival for your home, too. All right, if you want to keep your valuables safe, your clothes safe, what's a way to do that? I love the idea of a dry bag pre-pack it so that you have a change of clothes in here, but also think of things like an extra bottle of prescription medication, oh. maybe an extra pair of prescription eyeglasses, things that are safe, ready to grab. Do one of these for each member of your family, and it's great Smart. to complement that with a full medical kit as well. That's another great place to keep those extra prescriptions. Yeah. Oh, Jill. Jill, thank you. If we missed anything here, it is all on our website at hodaandjenna.com. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I served an amazing group of staff and students. Still to come on the Channel 2 News. Well, the waters are certainly receding now. Still too close to call. Lester Holt reporting from Ground Zero, as it's uh, being referred to. It is, in fact, a taste of freedom. The Haitian people know a little something about resiliency. What's the biggest risk right now? Some of the troops who have been drowned. I want to welcome you to the first presidential debate. In fact, we've been told we can't go any farther. Here are some resilient folks. Let me get a hint.
Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Do you feel like the bad guy in this? Why should they believe you when they, when they know that people are getting in? Has it been worth it to make this trip? Do you feel like you're giving a green light to politicians? How do you explain why your case has become so important? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's principal of the year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. With more of us spending a lot of time at home, uh, there's been added wear and tear on our appliances. If you need repairs, don't expect a quick fix. Vicki wins here with the latest on that. Vic. Hey, Al, it is so good to see you in person, by the way. Well, the requests for, requ for repairs are really coming in fast and furious across the country with backlogs for service calls at companies big and small. This morning, how you can make do while you wait and what you can do now, especially with the holidays right here, to check on your appliances before they stop working. Kylie Smith from New Jersey says when her refrigerator broke in early October, it was typical 2020. We noticed that our freezer wasn't freezing anymore. Once this happened, we said, of course, this is going to happen. <laughs> How are you managing then? We do have a second fridge out in the garage, but right now it's, it's filled to the brim. We have three growing boys, so we need the space. She says it'll be about a month until she can get her fridge repaired. And that's figuring that when they come out, it's an immediate fix. Smith is feeling a pain point shared by thousands of people across the country. A recent survey found appliance repair calls are up 39% since the pandemic started. With a lot of us working and learning from home, many of us are using our appliances a lot more often. From the oven to the fridge. Consider this fun fact. Before the pandemic, we were opening our fridges about 30 times a day. Since the pandemic, that number has jumped to 130 times a day. Industry experts say there's a shortage of new appliances and people want to save money, so many would rather repair than replace. Business has been uh, amazing. It's really grown over the last uh, several months. Daniel Pigeon is the CEO of Sears Home Services. How busy are your repair technicians right now? Right now, we have a shortfall of 1,000 technicians that we have that we're hiring. It really is uh, something unprecedented. Heather Dyer Yoder runs Dyer Repair Academy in Richland Hills, Texas. She says people who've lost jobs in retail and restaurants are now taking her two week long course to become certified appliance repair techs. Her classes are maxed out through January. I have employers calling me weekly do you have somebody i can hire all over the country all of my students get jobs all of them get hired before they leave dyer says to avoid breakdowns check on your appliance health look for your manual or check online for how to clean your fridge oven washer and dryer fridge coils and dryer vents are some common culprits that get clogged and make the machines work harder if a repair tech is coming to your home make sure they're wearing a mask and maintain your distance and keep your windows open for better air circulation while they're inside if you're in the market for a new appliance, go back to the basics because high-tech appliances contain specialized parts that can be harder to find and replace. Find something with less bells and whistles, less Wi-Fi, less computer chips because those are the things that are breaking and those are the things delaying you're getting your refrigerator back working. Some tips to make sure an appliance breakdown doesn't leave a wrench in your upcoming holiday plans. And good news for Kylie, her refrigerator has been repaired. Another tip, consider buying a home warranty, even if you've already been in your home for years. Just read the fine print to make sure it covers your major appliances. And what's also great about this, when you're under a home warranty, experts say you might get priority when you need a repair. Oh, yeah. yeah. All right. Oh, so, so if you're looking for a good technician, because that's really the key, True. how do you find one? First thing, ask friends and family for their referrals. They may have had a great experience with somebody. Then you really want to uh, check the reviews, make sure that they have good certifications. Get multiple quotes so that the price is right for you. And then also um, ask about their warranties. After they're done making that fix, how long is it good for in case they need to come back? And what if something is broken and you just need it fixed? Like going into Thanksgiving and your dishwasher is broken, what 
can people do? YouTube is a great way to check and see a DIY uh, repair situation. And also, you just want to call the local repair store. Maybe they'll give you some free advice. Listen, I've got this. I need this part. What can I do? Sometimes they'll help you out. Yeah. I, use, I use YouTube to clear the drain on my dishwasher. Really? Yeah. It does work. There's so many wow. great videos out there. All right. Vicki Wynn, it's always great to see you. Thanks so much. Each year, there are an estimated 20,000 fires across the country caused by chimneys and fireplaces. Investigators say the cause of the fire here on Bramer Circle was traced to a malfunctioning fireplace. The fire chief tells us the fire started in a chimney around 2.30 this morning. Even this historic mansion in Massachusetts burned to the ground last winter. The home had stood for over 100 years. It took just hours to be destroyed. This one in upstate New York making headlines because it's the home of celebrity chef Rachel Ray. Heavy smoke and fire coming from the roof of the residence near the chimney. Fire officials believe the August 9th blaze ignited in the chimney. So what should you do to safely enjoy this before you light this? We asked the expert, Mike Segerstrom from Bridgewater Chimney Sweeps is an instructor with the Chimney Safety Institute of America with 23 years of experience. Mike, what's the very first thing you should do before you light your fireplace for the season? First thing you want to do is make sure you have the fireplace inspected before use by a certified chimney sweep. That's you. Have at it. Okay. He begins with a visual inspection, checking the interior from below, then examining the exterior of the chimney from the ground and the roof, even using a high-tech camera to get a better look inside. According to the National Fire Protection Association, you need to get your chimney inspected every year because over time, chimneys collect what's called creosote, which can overheat and catch fire. Often, that's what causes chimney fires. Mike, what's the verdict on this fireplace and the chimney? So this fireplace is not in need of sweeping at this time. It is ready for the season. If it did need to be swept, what are some of the steps? What happens? The biggest component is we'll brush the entire system out internally. Once the chimney and the fireplace have been cleaned, what's the next step? Making sure that we're burning good wood in the fireplace. It should be stored outside for at least a year. That way you can guarantee that it's not going to produce extra amounts of soot or creosote. Before you enjoy your fireplace, make sure there's nothing flammable within four feet and always have a screen to capture any sparks that could fly into your home. Mike says the most common mistake people forgetting to open their flu damper. The first sign of someone not opening the flu damper is the smoke immediately comes back into the home. The best way to put out the fire is to simply let it burn out on its own and never use water to extinguish the flames. It's gonna cause the wood to sp possibly spark uh, and water in a hot fireplace could actually damage some of the masonry. If it's an emergency, make sure you have a fire extinguisher nearby and you know how to use it. Simple reminders to enjoy your fireplace safely. Hey everybody, it's Hoda Kotb from the Today Show. I am so, so excited to tell you about my new podcast, Making Space with Hoda Kotb. I sit down with some incredible people and we'll hear some uplifting stories. Listen to Making Space now on Apple Podcasts. Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? The vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Does the White House think they have an Afghanistan problem or a COVID problem? Do you believe the abortion issue should reflect the will of the people or the will of the elected officials? the vaccine mandate. Is this going to work or is this going to backfire? If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now with Nest Cam, these guys can check in 24 7. Hey, a little thief. The commercials are everywhere, so you can get an alert if someone's there who shouldn't be. Or the latest in smart home possible. technology from companies like Nest and Ring, allowing you to see what's happening in and around your house and protect it in real time. But what happens when the bad guys turn that technology against you? 
Across the country, hackers have gained access to those cameras and harassed families in their homes. In Seattle. In Florida. I'll leave you and your family alone. Or I could do this. And in Mississippi, an eight-year-old girl terrorized. I'm your best friend. You can do whatever you want right now. You can mess up your room. You can break your TV. So how easy is it for someone to hack into your home security system? To find out more, I'm here with Mark Spoonauer. He's the editor-in-chief of Tom's Guide. It's an online tech magazine. So tell me about this. How common of a problem is this, and how easy is it for hackers? So first things first is that it's not that common for devices like this to be hacked. But if it happens to you, it's really scary. He says the devices themselves are secure, but warns that hackers can break in using compromised credentials. And they usually come in through usernames and passwords that are out there on the dark web. Tom's Guide security editor Paul Wagonseal is in another room logging into this Nest camera to show you how easily it can happen. Hey guys, I'm logged in and I can hear you and I can see you. That is very creepy. That is not supposed to be happening with a security camera. No, it's not. And the reason why he's be able to get in is because he has access not to the device itself necessarily. It's because he's able to log in with our username and password, which could be freely available on the web, especially if you've been part of a data breach. How do you know if you've been part of a data breach? You can search online at haveibeenpwned.com. Just plug in your username. If it comes up red, it's time for a new one. And when creating a password, remember that it should be long, unique, and strong. But Spoonhour says the most important thing to do, use two-factor authentication. When a hacker tries to get in, you will get sent a text message to your phone because they're not on a approved network, right? And that unique code that's sent to your phone via text allows you to grant access or not to whoever is trying to get into your system. So it alerts you before anyone can get in. That's right. It's a basically a gatekeeper. Wagon Seal tries to log in again, but this time there's two-factor authentication. There it is. So we have a text message that just came in. Okay, what does that mean? So this is our authentication code, right? So if we wanted to get in right now to log into our system and see the footage on this camera, we would have to not only enter our username and password, but this very unique code. And you can see that it changes every time. Uh -huh. So only the person who has the phone that's associated with the account can get in. So Good advice to make sure this doesn't happen to you. I'm your best friend. A few more tips. Don't forget about your router. That's the hub of your home. Make sure you're not using the default password that it came with. If you don't change that, the bad guys can easily use it to get into your smart home if they find your Wi-Fi network, and that would affect anything that's connected to your Wi-Fi. Now, these same security measures also apply to smart toys that connect to the Internet. If they have a camera or a microphone, hackers can get into those toys. So choose passwords that are unique, long, and different across your device. These are places we may not be able to visit for a while. Come with us as we take you there, into our incredible world. There are places whose very name reverberates with larger-than-life legends and characters. This road winds through one of those places, Transylvania. The name means land beyond the forest, a mountainous region of Eastern Europe. But what it means to most of us is the blood-soaked story of Dracula. The Vampire Count. Little wonder that in Transylvania, even the graveyards seem more eerie, and my Transylvanian guide, Bogdan Popper, is well versed. It's a piece of superstition that if you have a damaged grave like this one, someone or something may pop out of it. You say that it's just superstition, and yet they found bodies with stakes through the heart. Yes, actually it's a proof that superstitions are very strong. Even Romans feared monsters in this region, yet it was in the 19th century, the era of science, that Bram Stoker dreamed up a tale of terror, telling of a traveler arriving in a mysterious castle in Transylvania. I know what you're thinking. Don't go up there. And high on this ragged mountain, the very castle where Bram Stoker imagined Dracula lived. The 
with its sheer stone stairways, dark panelled rooms, there's even a secret passageway. It's the perfect setting to meet the vampire count. I am Dracula. I bid you welcome. They say truth can be stranger than fiction, scarier and bloodier too. Close to the castle, back in the 15th century, lived a warlord so infamous he had many names. Vlad III, also Vlad the Impaler, and Vlad Dracula. The meaning of the name Dracul in Romania, it's the devil. Dracula, it's the devil's son. Historian Matteo Simeon says Vlad was a bloodthirsty killer. He impaled his enemies. The impaler was a nickname that came later with the brutal habit that... Matteo's description of impaling, so how can I put it, vivid, you really don't want to hear it. Would you like to know more? Not really, no. Okay. <laughs> 500 years later, the King family from Michigan feels safe. In the day, anyway. Is it scary here? <laughs> <laughs> But at night, according to the story, Dracula goes in search of innocent victims. <laughs> Sunrise. Thank goodness for that. And this morning, we arrive at the medieval town of Sigishwara. So this is where Dracula was born? Yes, he was born in this house. This is where his father used to live. He's born here in 1431. He looks fierce. And though he was a ruthless ruler, someone's left flowers here. He's hugely popular in Romania for being, you know, this kind of cruel but fair ruler. Everyone loves him. Many modern Romanians romanticize Vlad's cold-bloodedness. Vlad the Impaler, Dracula, is their preferred politician. I think everyone would answer with a yes here in <laughs> Romania. <laughs> Makes you think, doesn't it, about the true nature of politics and our fascination with brutality and barbarism. It's tomato juice. We're on the road again, on the trail of another fantastic creature that has haunted people's imagination for hundreds of years. Frankenstein. The most dreaded creation of man, the monster of Frankensteins. Our first stop on the Frankenstein Trail, Switzerland, and the spectacular setting of Lake Geneva. It was here 200 years ago at the Villa Diodati, one rainy night that teenager Mary Shelley dreamed up her tale of terror. It tells of how Victor Frankenstein, using dead bodies stolen from graveyards, created a man it's alive. and brought it back to life. It's alive! It's alive! And Frankenstein, it seems, like Dracula, may have had a ring of truth. Because shortly before Mary Shelley wrote her book, she had been traveling through Germany where a remote village has a dark history. Can anyone tell me the way to Castle Frankenstein? By the time I reach the castle, it is nightfall. Yeah? Can I come in? Welcome to Castle Frankenstein. Walter Sheila has spent 30 years researching this decaying castle. This is the area Mary Shelley looked around. So she wow. was here. It was once home to a noble family. So these are the Frankensteins. These are the Frankenstein families, and these are their tombstones you see here. And one of them was a real-life mad scientist. So this is him. This is, is Johann Konrad Titel von Frankenstein. He's the real father of the monster. 
This is the guy that Mary Shelley this was writing about. This is the guy about. from whom Mary Shelley knew the story of the monster. The real Frankenstein. The real Frankenstein. This Frankenstein experimented on bodies dug up from a nearby cemetery. He made his experiments with the parts of the bodies and with electricity. And he this tower was the place where the flashes of lightning threw in and gave electricity to the bodies. To make the them part. come yes. alive. Like in the movie. Unlike in those classic universal movies, no Frankenstein's monster was ever brought to life. There was no walking dead terrorizing the village. But... A lot of people who live around here, as they say, this is a very bad place to stay during the night. The devil is playing his fools. I don't know, I've never seen him. You've never seen the devil? No, never. I'm glad I'm with you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'm the devil for that. <laughs> Good night, my friend. Frankenstein and Dracula, men who became monsters. Why do we find them so fascinating? Our next monster is not human at all. And for that, we have to go to a certain lake in Scotland. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends of today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Boom. Shop today with Joe Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. Controversy in South Lake tonight after teens posted a racist video. It was a wealthy, idyllic town forced to confront racism. My children were told Rosa Parks is dead. You all have to sit in the back of the bus. But when the school board presented its plan, this small town fight ignited a national firestorm. Critical race theory. Racism in reverse. False narrative of rampant racism. Shame. This is South Lake, an NBC News podcast. All episodes available now. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Scotland, on the road north to the rugged highlands, a country of breathtaking landscapes, ancient castles, and lakes, the Scots Lochs. So this is Loch Ness. This vast loch easily lends itself to legend. A monster? Really? Here at Loch Ness, there have been hundreds of so-called sightings describing a huge and mysterious creature. Up behind us here, a little bit up the loch, 20 odd years ago, sitting beside the loch in my car, and I saw this black hump come out of the water, and I have no idea to this day what it was. He saw an object which he described as like an upturned boat. It turned, went against the headwind, and disappeared. There were nine witnesses. Ancient Celtic legend tells of a beast in the water, and there is a record of an apparent encounter here thousand years ago. But it was during the 1930s that the beast was given a name, the Loch Ness Monster or more affectionately, Nessie. All over the loch, eyewitnesses describe seeing a creature some claimed looked like a prehistoric reptile called a plesiosaur, both in and out of the water. And in one infamous sighting, a couple driving on this road saw a huge creature, maybe 30 feet long, slither in front of them and plunge into the loch. So to understand the lure of the loch, begin with a man who has lived on the shore in a van for almost 30 years. There's, there's a majesty about this place. There's an energy that pours off of here. There's a palpable feeling of, well, it's, it's legend. Steve Feltham scans the surface every day for hours at a time. He too says, 
he has seen the monster. It was like a torpedo going through the water, the size of a car going through there. But does Steve think Nessie is a plesiosaur? Nessie could still turn out to be a dinosaur, but at the moment I see it more likely to turn out to be something like a whale's catfish, the biggest freshwater fish in the world. It grows to about four or five metres long. They live for a hundred years. It's got a smooth back, which is what people describe here. The hump, the upturned boat type hump going through the water. How are you doing? How are, How are you? Good, yeah? Hi, nice to meet you. For decades, enthusiasts and even scientists have been searching for facts in this Loch Ness fiction. Skipper Dick Rayner has been investigating the mystery of Loch Ness for 50 years. The thing we were looking for was between 20 and 40 feet long. 40 feet long? Yeah. I think we're going to need a bigger boat. If there is a creature hiding here, Dick says sonar should be the best way to track it down. We're over the deepest part now. Wow, 745 feet. What is that? About halfway down, what is that? It's not an enormous monster appearing on our sonar right there. I don't think so. No. Are you sure? Because that looks pretty, look, look at that. Make the most of your day with Today All Day. Get closer to all your friends in today in a whole new way. Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. Oh, that's just shop today with Jill Martin. We're helping you shop like never before. The latest styles and biggest names. Today food. Things are heating up in the Today All Day Kitchen. Cooking essentials and recipe inspiration. Get ready. Are you ready? Oh, I'm so ready. Only on Today All Day. News is more than a headline. It informs, it inspires, and it still matters. To cover it, you have to be in it. And that's what we're gonna do. Every night, we take you to the front lines of the story, where it's actually happening, with NBC News journalists on the ground from all over the world. We cover what you need to know and bring your news feed to life. In primetime and streaming live, it's your news playlist every night. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at seven on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. We'll take you to the front lines of the story, bringing your news feed to life. Streaming live every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. The coronavirus come back next year. So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Make the most of your day with Today in 30. We give you a mix of everything you love about our show in a mere 30 minutes. <laughs> Savannah and Hoda bring you What You Must Know, the biggest moments of the morning. One Republic! Exclusive interviews. Why did it work for you? You're right. I am more talented than the rest. <laughs> and important headlines. Major medical news this morning. Watch Today in 30 on your schedule. Streaming every day on Today All Day. Over the years, teams of Nessie hunters have used sonar and submarines to search the dark waters of Loch Ness. But the only monster they ever found was this 30-foot Nessie movie prop that sank 50 years ago. Definite fake. Right. Three hay bales covered in tarpaulins. The evidence against there being a monster here has been stacking up. Most of the photos of Nessie are hoaxes. He towed a nice bit of fiberglass behind his boat. But this is the famous one, the iconic picture of Loch Ness. Yes. Right. But what, what people think now is that it's actually this little thing. It's a submarine with a plasticine monster's head on top of it. The last best hope of finding some truth here is perhaps the most bizarrely counterintuitive project of them all. They've been looking for the mythical monster in microscopic particles. That uh, deceptively clear looking water actually contains an abundance of life. An international scientific team led by Professor Neil Gemmell from New Zealand is cracking right. the Loch Ness okay. Code using environmental or eDNA. So what we're getting is a snapshot of life in Loch Ness over the last few days. We've got bacteria in there, we've got microorganisms in there. But we've also got traces of larger animals, fish. And perhaps there's something mysterious in there too that hasn't been described by science. Who knows? You've got 
quite a bit out of the northern basin. Mm -hmm. With the help of a local naturalist, Adrian Schein, who has studied Loch Ness for more than 40 years, the scientists took hundreds of water samples from all over the loch. Back at his university in New Zealand, the samples were analysed by Professor Gemmel and by several other labs around the world. Their results cross-referenced with a gigantic DNA database, producing a complete picture of everything that lives in Loch Ness. All right, well, thank you. A year after we first met him, Professor Gemmel was ready to announce his dramatic findings to the world. Let's get down to it. Is there a plesiosaur in Loch Ness? No. No trace, then, he says, of an ancient dinosaur lurking in the loch. No giant catfish DNA, either. But, says Professor Gamel, there is one possibility that may explain all those eyewitness sightings here. Could Nessie be a giant eel? There is large amounts of eel DNA in Loch Ness. Now, is it possible that what people are seeing is a giant eel? Well, maybe. It's plausible that there might be one that, that or two that, that, that grow to extreme size. So, case closed? Well, of course, you cannot know what you don't know. So the mystery of Loch Ness will surely endure, ensuring that the tourists keep coming back. We came to find the monster and, um, we did. you know, we did. <laughs> We've got a sighting here. It might be a giant eel. I don't think so. No? Eels don't have legs. And it is perhaps the mystery, not the monster, that people cannot turn away from, even in this 21st century, which reflects more on all of us than what's in this loch. Lakes are, in a sense, lost worlds, and especially Loch Ness. It's deep, it's dark, it's cold, it's hostile, and it's big. So. It gives us the lost world element, but it is also accessible. And I think it's that combination of mystery and accessibility which has given Loch Ness the cachet which it has. It would be a shame, wouldn't it, in a way, if computers and DNA science took away the mystery? Um, well, you never would, you see, because as long as people want to believe in Loch Ness monsters, there'll be Loch Ness monsters. <laughs> when you are here, at dusk, looking out over these dark waters, it's easy to understand why people once feared something lurking beneath. And maybe, even today, we need to believe in monsters and evil so we get to be the good guys. Or perhaps we just like to be scared. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go! Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. Hey everybody, it's Hoda Kotb from the Today Show. I am so, so excited to tell you about my new podcast, Making Space with Hoda Kotb. I sit down with some incredible people and we'll hear some uplifting stories. Listen to Making Space now on Apple Podcasts. For breaking news in our changing world, Download the NBC News app. Hey everybody, it's Hoda Kotb from the Today Show. I am so, so excited to tell you about my new podcast, Making Space with Hoda Kotb. I sit down with some incredible people and we'll hear some uplifting stories. Listen to Making Space now on Apple Podcasts. Sometimes the news can be difficult and overwhelming for kids to understand. Will coronavirus come back next year? So to help make sense of it all, we've created a newscast just for them. Man, you know a lot. We hope your family will watch Nightly News Kids Edition. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today. Let's go. Is the Delta variant more dangerous to kids, or is it simply more transmissible? Maryland's Principal of the Year. I serve an amazing group of staff and students. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. The Meet the Press Chuck Todd cast, free wherever you get your podcasts. Along a coastal road is a lesson for us all. 25 years after Chernobyl, another nuclear disaster happened here, Fukushima. We're traveling to the heart of a place that visibly demonstrates we humans are entirely capable 
of making the same mistake twice. It began with nature, the strongest earthquake in Japan's history. The clock on the beach house still frozen in time. First the earthquake struck, then the tsunami submerged this third floor. Destruction doesn't describe it. The deadly wall of water engulfing entire communities. More than 15,000 dead and another 2,500 still missing. The tsunami smashing into Fukushima's power station and knocking out backup generators. Meltdowns and explosions followed. Then the radiation came. I thought someday it was going to happen. And then it happened. Buddhist priest Sadamaro Akano had become concerned about radiation safety, knowing he was living near a nuclear plant. He installed a Geiger counter at his temple. Then his worst fears came true. How did you feel when you saw this? So scared. Because this is the first time to raising up the radiation levels. You'd never seen anything like never, this? Never, never ever seen this. This was Main Street, in the town of Futaba, two miles from the reactor. Once home to almost 7,000 people, it's now a ghost town. Homes abandoned, gardens overgrown. Today, only wildlife live here. The danger is large areas of fields and forests haven't been decontaminated, like this. Our radiation monitor raises the alarm. Levels too high for people to inhabit this place. Former Futaba residents Anthony Ballard and Philip Jellyman have been coming back to the exclusion zone with special permission. Taking pictures. Off Main Street. Anthony shows me where he used to live. So this is home? This was home. When they fled, he left family photos behind. This is Daniel. This is one of my sister's kids. Uh, he's actually at university now. He had made Futaba his home. Now Fukushima has taught him what home really means. I think that stuff's not important because you can get... It's the life that was here before that was important. I can see you're, you're in tears. Not quite, but almost, yeah. <laughs> Immediately after the earthquake, people took shelter at the school where Philip taught. They slept on floors, mattresses still strewn around. You can see in this classroom, people's bags have been left behind. Yeah, never to be retrieved. This is now Futaba School, but it's not in Futaba. Some of the students spend an hour to get here. Philip and Anthony teach them English and about home. The children, refugees from the radiation. We travel to the nuclear plant itself for a rare tour. First, we're given personal radiation monitors after the meltdown in 2011, the area was so toxic, workers had to wear hazmat suits. Since then, the plant has been stabilized. It is stunning that I can stand here with so little protective gear on. The melted core of the reactors are just there. Deep inside, this video filmed by robots shows that melted core, still highly radioactive. Outside, our radiation meter measuring 85 microsieverts per hour and more, the highest of our trip, safe for short periods. For us to take an even closer look, 
a little more protection is needed. Are you sure it's safe? Yeah, yeah it's safe. safe. From here, you can still see the scars from 2011. We keep our radiation monitor close. The more immediate problem, the water that is used to cool the reactors, treated but still radioactive, there's enough to fill 400 Olympic swimming pools. They're running out of space. One option to slowly pour it into the Pacific. It is simply not contaminated water. It's a purified water. So no decision has yet been made, but scientifically, whatever the decision will be, there will be no problem. Many locals are not convinced. Do you think that they should release the water into the ocean? No. They should not. Mm. The local fishermen are just recovering. Every catch is tested for radiation. It's tested, it's safe, and yet you can't help thinking, should I eat it? It's good. The thing that's had the greatest impact on me coming here is perhaps not the devastation that was wrought by the earthquake and then the tsunami, or the fact that now I can walk in this place that was hit by radiation without any protective gear on. It is that the houses and stores in this street that you still see standing are here because the people who owned them wanted to hold on to them. And they wanted to hold on to them because this is home to them. People like 75-year-old Katsuhide Akara. We left with only what we were wearing. We initially thought we would be able to go home in three or four days. But sadly, that was not the case. Philip and Anthony visit Okara to deliver photos of his garden, overgrown with weeds. But he is still grateful. The good memories seem like yesterday. Futaba is still my home. A home that the children may one day be able to return to. Do you remember your hometown? Uh, yes. And bring life back to these empty streets. The people who lived here will never forget. And we should all remember, not just that our lives can be irrevocably, catastrophically turned upside down, but that if we truly learn from the past, we can make a better future and a better world. Oh, hello. Hello, Today All Day Land. You are watching our digital show today in 30, and I must say, you look fabulous today. I do. So we love that you decided to spend part of your Tuesday with us. We have a big morning in studio today, so we're going to break down what we're bringing you. All right, we're going to start with the bombshell in the NFL Raiders. Coach John Gruden resigning. He's out after a slew of offensive emails surface. We're going to have a full report from the West Coast. We also touch on a bright spot in the NFL. Wait until you see how many members of the Kansas City Chiefs are making their city proud by working